China's business confidence has fallen to its lowest level since January of 2013, according to a survey by World Economics on Monday, reflecting the impact of surging COVID cases on economic activity with the abrupt lifting of many pandemic control measures. The index fell to 48.1 in December from 51.8 in November, the lowest since the survey began in 2013. The results were among the first indicators of how business sentiment has taken a hit in the world's second biggest economy, after the sharp relaxation of strict COVID containment measures on the 7th of December, triggering a still-growing wave of domestic COVID cases across China. Well, the economics said that the survey suggests strongly that the growth rate of the Chinese economy has slowed quite dramatically and may be heading for recession in 2023. China's GDP is expected to grow just 3% this year, its worst performance in nearly half a century. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The survey showed business activity fell sharply in December, with the sales managers' indexes in manufacturing and service sectors broke below the 50 level. China has recently dismantled some key parts of the world's toughest anti-COVID curbs and lockdowns. The measures were championed by President Xi Jinping, but impaired the economy and sparked popular protests unprecedented in its decade-long rule. The top leaders and policymakers will focus on stabilizing the economy in 2023 and stepping up policy adjustments to ensure key targets are met, according to an agenda-setting meeting ending on Friday. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The French economy is set to slow sharply next year in the face of an energy price shock, but should recover some lost ground from 2024. That's according to the central bank that was forecast on Saturday, revising down its outlook slightly. The Eurozone's second biggest economy is on course to slow from 2.6% growth this year to only 0.3% in 2023. The Bank of France said in an update of its long-term economic outlook, trimming its 2023 forecast from 0.5% previously. However, with the outlook highly dependent on gas supplies, a recession could not be ruled out, adding that growth next year could be anywhere between minus 0.3% and 0.8%. That was lower than the 1% growth forecast the government has built into its 2023 budget, a target that a finance ministry official said remained confident was within reach. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The central bank said that once the energy price crisis eases, growth was expected to pick up, reaching 1.2% in 2024 1.8% in 2025. Previously, it forecast 2024 growth of 1.8%. On inflation, the central bank estimated a peak in early 2023 and an average EU harmonise rate next year of 6% followed by 2.5% in 2024 and 2.2% in 2025. The European Central Bank has raised its interest rates four times, most recently by 50 basis points on Thursday, as it seeks to contain surging price pressures.
In light of the weak growth outlook, the Bank of France forecasts the budget deficit would widen from 5% of economic output to this year to 5.4% next year. The government expects it's an unchained fiscal shortfall. So what do you think? You can leave a comment below, you can like and subscribe to our channel and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our other videos. I'm Rachel for Calcai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Italy is set to scrap part of its plans to facilitate cash payments for goods and services after criticism from European Union authorities, according to Economy Minister Giancarlo Giorgetti. In its draft 2023 budget, the government had proposed changing the current system in which sellers risk fines if they refuse to accept card payments by saying no penalties would be imposed for transactions below 60 euros. The move drew criticism from the European Commission, which said it was not consistent with previous EU recommendations to Italy to boost tax compliance. And Giorgetti told Parliament late on Sunday that the government had backtracked. The minister said that Italy intends to eliminate the measure on points of sales and some sort of compensatory measures may be introduced to help shopkeepers pay the commission fees on card transactions. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. But critics say that cash payments encourage tax dodges in a country where around 100 billion euros in taxes and social contributions are evaded every year according to Treasury data. The current fines, which amount to 30 euros plus 4% of the value of the transaction, were one of the conditions for a 21 billion euro tranche on the EU's post-COVID recovery fund money that Rome secured in the first half of this year. Despite the latest developments, Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney, who took office in October, continues to be the more indulgent towards cash than her predecessors. Her first budget, which must be approved by Parliament before year's end, raises a limit on cash payments to €5,000 from next year, up from a previous ceiling of 1000 Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkai Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Calkine Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Vincent Kandrawanata. He's the founder of Renovatio Bioscience. Now, Renovatio develops nutritional supplements that are world leading in their purity and effectiveness. So here to tell us more is Dr. Vincent. Hello today. Hi, good morning, Rachel. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Great to speak with you today. We're very interested to hear more about your company. Now, you do offer one of the most potent broad-spectrum dietary antioxidants made from apples. 
Could you please elaborate on this painted technology and how you came about discovering this? That's correct, and I'll do you one better. It is the most potent dietary antioxidant on the planet. And the reason why we have the confidence in saying that was because the company was born out of research at the University of Newcastle, Australia, and it was a joint research with the Department of Primary Industries New South Wales. In 2010, I led the research team to figure out how to revolutionize the technique in the extraction of phenolic antioxidants from natural sources, in this case, apples. Before my technology came along, there are only two ways to create antioxidant supplements. The first one was synthesizing it in the lab, and the second one was to extract these antioxidants using chemical solvents such as acetone, methanol, and ethanol. And the issue with both of these uh, technologies at that time was that the absorption rate in the body was only between three to five percent. And that's the reason why we use the word potency, because when people say the word the most powerful or the highest concentration uh, antioxidants, those are marketing terms that cannot be defined scientifically, because it doesn't really matter how high or how powerful an antioxidant is. What matters is that what your body can absorb. Using my technology, which is patented, uh, the absorption rate of this antioxidant supplement goes from 3 to 5% all the way up to 97% in our body. And that's the reason why we can say that it is the most potent dietary antioxidant because it is natural, it's extracted from 100% Australian apples, and it's absorbable and therefore usable by your body. And what pushed you to do the research into this area to help you find out about this? Well, uh, it came from uh, my passion working with uh, Australian apple farmers. Back in 2009-2010, our apple farmers were struggling competing with imported products, fruit products, including uh, fruit juices from overseas. And it was so bad to the point where even if they got their uh, fruits, in this case apples for free, they were not able to actually produce things as cheaply as uh, imported products. So my research team was tasked with, with, with one goal to find out the, the benefits and, and, and the competitive edge of what Australian produce can offer. And, and, and our apples come from a region in New South Wales called Orange, and it's quite funny, apples from Orange. And uh, the growing condition is so good to, to give you the best, the best things that apples can offer because of the volcanic soil, the, the specific climate that needs to be, to, that is required by the plants to produce a high concentration of antioxidants uh, to start with. Coupled with our technology, we are offering and showcasing uh, the best apples in the world, which is from uh, Orange Region, New South Wales. And I'm very proud to be, to be representing our primary industries, including our farmers in the, on the world stage. That is fascinating. And, and what ways are phenolics powerful antioxidants for the body? So um, uh, to, to also pick up on your uh, previous question, the research started with that, uh, with that goal. However, to, to make the jump or the transition from being a scientist and researcher into being in the, in the business world, being an entrepreneur, uh, was actually due to the experience that I had with my grandma. When I went back to Indonesia, I was born in Indonesia and I came to Australia for my, uh, to study my degree. I went back to Indonesia. I saw my grandma was basically wheelchair bound because of the severe joint pain on both of her knees. And at that time in 2012, I only just uh, invented the technology and I told her that I have something from my lab that will help you. If you, if you trust me enough, uh, please take it. And uh, three months later, she, she and my grandpa came to visit me in Australia and uh, she was walking six kilometers a day. And at that time, uh, that was very moving for me because um, I basically changed someone's life. And the reason why I, I went into research, I wanted to be a researcher was to use what I know to change the world in this, in this case, making it healthier. And that is reflected in the name that I chose for my company, which is Renovatio. In Latin, Renovatio means new life. And, and it is our, our goal, our mission to give people a new life in the way that they can be healthier and happier. 
It's amazing that your company has helped you um, and helped your loved ones. It's a phenomenal story. Now, you have a multi-million dollar expansion deal with Woolworths. What can you tell me about this and what does that mean for your company? Yeah, uh, it is both a personal achievement as well as a career defining moment for me uh, when we partner with Woolworths. I, I have to say we have been very fortunate to partner with a retail giant, the, the, the largest retailer in Australia, uh, who, who understand what I'm trying to achieve, what, what, what my dreams are. And they, uh, after the initial success of rolling out our core products, which is the activated phenolics powder, an, an Apple Day tablets, as well as the Immunity Plus tablets, they then partner up with us in terms of finding out what other products that can help people. And in this case, uh, we proposed to them and they accepted two new products in the, in the, in the five minutes category, which is mental resilience and skin remedy. The reason why I chose uh, to, to, to further research into creating a product called mental resilience is because with COVID, um, the instability of the world, a natural disaster, I really think that it is, it is important for us to remember that we need help in terms of not only physically, but also mentally to help uh, Australians to, to be more resilient in terms of their uh, mental health and putting more spotlight into the importance of mental well-being. And I think we are one of the first, if not the first company that comes up with uh, this formulation and putting it on the shelves. We, we really want to fight the stigma that uh, you, need, you, you need to struggle on your own. We want to, to, to let people know that it is, you can pick up your, 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 your groceries while picking up mental resilience in, in, in the supermarket in terms of boosting that re resiliency, helping you with fighting mal anxiety and stress, improving your sleep. And the same goes with a skin remedy. A lot of people think that when we branch out to skincare, it is only about vanity, but it goes it goes deeper than just skin deep because uh, skin health is really important, especially coming from a place where when I was younger, I I fought I battled with cystic acne as well as rosacea, and it really took a toll on my confidence, my mental health. So I think uh, taking care of our skin, having a good, healthy skin really goes beyond just the vanity aspect. It helps people with mild uh, eczema, with psoriasis, with dermatitis, acne and pimple. And I think as much as um, it helps from the outside, it's also important uh, to, to boost that from the inside. Absolutely. Now, how can a consumer ensure that a product is safe and healthy for them? Can people become more aware while they're shopping, especially uh, you mentioned their beauty care products? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it is really important to choose a products from companies that put research at the forefront of its mission. Unlike other companies, our company were, uh, was not founded, founded because we want to sell product. Uh, we started with research. We started with the, a piece of technology, home, homegrown uh, new technology uh, invented uh, by, by uh, Australian research team by, in, in, in a leading uh, Australian University and I think that puts a lot of credibility to what we put out because people can go and research the technology behind that we have a we have always make we have always uh, making sure that people understand about technology the difference between our product and other people's product and not only that uh, especially for our skincare range we also have the uh, the ultra serum which uh, which is really something that people can try and see the difference even even after uh, the first use and we did study on this and i think it is very important for us being in the health and beauty industry to make sure that our product has integrity because we are not only representing our company we are representing australia as as, as a whole and and, and i think uh, being australian made from 100 percent australian apples that every step of the way in the in the production of our uh, products has that level of quality control because as you know um, we sometimes probably some of us take it for granted that we, we live in a country where the produce is safe the quality control is, is, is of high standard but that Australian made and grown uh, label or certification that we have really put that uh, seal of 
seal of approval in terms of quality, especially when we export our products to, to the international market. And just lastly, Vincent, what are your objectives for Renovatio Bioscience for this year, for 2022? I really think that uh, we are a company that has a big dream. Our dream is to give people an opportunity to have a happier and healthier life. We, we are at the forefront of preventative healthcare in terms of making sure that people understand the importance of fighting inflammation. Our body is made of trillions of cells. So if we take care of the health of our cells, it will manifest in terms of our health physically as well as mentally. And I really would like uh, to invite people to, to find out more about our products because when you purchase our product, you're not only supporting us, you're supporting your health and you're also supporting Australian apple farmers. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Rachel. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. And that was Dr. Vincent Kandruwinata. He's founder of Renovatio Bioscience. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Kalkine Media. So make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space, and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Shares in Australia's star entertainment group tumbled nearly 12% on Monday after the New South Wales government proposed to raise taxes on casino poker machine operators in the state from July next year. The potential gaming tax changes, which will affect Star's operations in Sydney, which made up half of its revenue in fiscal 2022, according to its annual report, could raise an additional $364 million over the next three years if implemented. New South Wales Treasurer Matt Keane said on Saturday the money raised will be used to help fund vital services like helping communities recover from the impacts of COVID-19, bushfires and floods. The move comes amid increased efforts to reform Australia's gambling industry, which has been rolled in damning reports of sidestepping anti-money laundering rules, dysfunctional governance and poor corporate culture. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Star Entertainment Group said in a statement on Monday that it had not been consulted by the New South Wales government on the matter and that it is seeking to urgently engage with the government as to the sustainability of the proposed tax changes and the impact on the star's business. The company's shares hit their lowest since April of 23rd, 2020. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space, and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now.
Welcome to Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Hemant Mehta. He is the CEO and the founder of OpenBI, or OpenBI, which is a global innovation platform that provides a suite of solutions to help businesses of all sizes and developers from different backgrounds to simplify their data journey and basically automate essential business processes to save hours of manual labor with the help of business intelligence, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. So here to tell us more is the founder and CEO, Hemant Mehta. Welcome to the show, Hemant. Thank you for having me today on your show, Sage. We're so glad you're to be with us. Yes, please. No, please go ahead. No, you're absolutely correct. So, so we help companies to find insights and uh, help them with their data discovery. Wonderful. So let's dive in and find out a bit more, Hemant. Everything starts with data these days. We can't ignore that fact. And you help people in this journey. Would you please talk about the tools you provide that enable people to use data easily? Yes, absolutely. So there are tons and tons of data around us. Uh, most of these data are raw data that needs to go through several processes before it is ready for analysis. Else the data are of no use. In a nutshell, uh, we need different applications to visualize these data more efficiently so we can find insights and make informed decisions. I tell everyone that data is like an ocean. Dive deep to find treasure such as insights and new opportunities. This is exactly what we do at OpenBI. We help businesses transform their raw data into meaningful insights so they can make informed decisions. OpenBI is an enterprise business intelligence suite that comes with various modules as a package to help everyone visualize data more efficiently. So we provide powerful reporting server that allows users from BERT, Jasper, and Pentavo community to publish and manage their reports. And it comes with a lot of advanced reporting features such as scheduling, uh, report busting, group reports, and many more. We also help um, users with dashboards and analytical capabilities with no-code, low-code approach designed for all type of users from people in the front desk to management and to the developers. For advanced users and companies um, who wants to apply machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, on top of their uh, visualization, uh, they can now use popular scripting language like Python and R to extend the machine learning capabilities within their visualization. And we That's also okay. help, yeah, we also help many plug and play solutions SaaS based so that the companies like um, Asana, Monday.com and Salesforce users can actually uh, use OpenBI to take this to the next level. Wonderful. Thank you for summing that up for us. Now, how corporations deal with data changed significantly about maybe 10 to 12 years ago and how business operate and, and employees engage also um, seem to become more important about 10 to 12 years ago um, and that reflects in how customers then react to the business. So can you tell us more about the significance of data visualizations for organizations, communities and individuals? Yes, definitely. So data visualization can help improve business efficiency. So not like traditional business intelligence tool these days, everything is more dynamic. So if, if the data visualization is implemented and used correctly, uh, then it can save tons of uh, time and uh, it can help reduce the significant cost as well. So our mission at OpenBI is to create a data culture to help people, organization, and the community to see and understand the data. And this can be achieved by empowering everyone with the data-driven tool. So here are some key advantages of data visualization. It can help find valuable business insights, increase customer satisfaction, identify market trends, increase operational efficiency, uh, improved and accurate decision making, increased revenue, and help organization to build fast and accurate reports and better return on investment. So it can significantly change the way business operates. Excellent. And now sometimes in the business world, um, 
it can get flooded and saturated with jargon and technical terms that get sort of flung around the boardrooms but don't really have a true sense of meaning or doing, so to speak. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the not so tech savvy people can begin their data with the visualization journey, please? I couldn't agree with you more on this, Sage. Uh, there is a great saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. The idea of data visualization is to simplify and make end users understand the story that data has to tell in a simple and presentable way through the visualization. An OpenBI application is designed to provide no-code, low-code approach. So people with less technical background, they do not have to worry at all, which essentially means you do not need to have any technical knowledge whatsoever. As long as you have a business knowledge uh, and business understanding, you are good to create different visualization by simply using drag and drop components within the application itself. So we welcome everyone to experience no-code, low-code OpenBI apps. That's fantastic. Now I'm looking at your um, B-roll that's coming up there with the data visualization examples, and it looks very similar to Google Analytics. So it's all compatible with the major brands. Can you tell us a little bit more about the end-to-end -end analytical solutions, please? And also, which industries you're finding a lot of your clients are coming from? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. This is a great question, and I'm glad that you asked. Um, so you rightly said that it is quite similar to different analytical tools, and which is exactly what it is. The fundamental remains the same. So we intend to simplify the entire end-to-end -end process and empower business with their analytical journey in three simple steps. So we allow them to connect with the data, help them to create different type of visualization, they want to, to help understand the business processes and to visualize data more effectively. And then a convey where they can publish the message to the end client through visualizations and incorporate third party visual libraries within a OpenBI so that they can actually work with multiple applications and see a unified platform. Great, thank you for explaining that. So um, in regards to the industries that are mainly seeking out your services at the moment, are you finding it's e-commerce? Uh, it's mainly, uh, so we are not industry specific. Okay. Uh, so we work with different verticals. So our main clients are from financial background, from ERP systems, from the security background, so SOC. Uh, and we work, we have many clients across Europe and uh, in Austria, in, in some in Middle East, some in India as well. And we have started our uh, journey in the, in the North America region as well. Excellent. Well, hopefully uh, you'll gain some clients from Australia as well after this fantastic interview. And as we reach the end of the interview and start winding up, please tell us about what your near-term plans are at OpenBI. BI. Yes, at OpenBI, we pride on what we do and are looking to expand, uh, as you rightly said, that in, in Australia. So we are, we are planning to expand our network across different geography uh, in coming years and would like to invite individuals and companies uh, from different uh, domains to benefit from data-driven technologies. We want to encourage and build an ecosystem for developers and companies to build plug-and-play solutions for their businesses and in their expert area using OpenBI and make it available to wider audience through OpenBI Marketplace in returns for rewards and recognition. So to quickly summarize, OpenBI is free to download with unlimited users and there is no license fees to pay. And um, for more information on how you can download, what are the charges you might have to pay, uh, we recommend to visit our website uh, and visit uh, an FAQ section at opnbi.com. And finally, um, I would like to thank you, the team at Kalkine TV, for giving us an opportunity to explain the benefits of OpenBI to uh, everyone and who wants to adopt a data-driven culture in their workplace. Well, it sounds like a very time-efficient and potentially cost-efficient service, um, which will just simplify the whole process of analytics and data visualization. So it sounds great. Thank you so much for sharing what you do with us, Hemant. We really do appreciate your insights. 
Thank you, Sage. Um, Thank you. you Bye-bye. If you just joined us, we had a very informative discussion with Hemant Mehta. He's the founder of OpenBI as well as a CEO. And keep watching for more of these excellent expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calco Media. Right now, Calcine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. A group of investors has tabled resolutions urging four of the world's top oil and gas companies to set broad climate targets for 2030, reviving pressure on the sector after a year that saw governments shift their focus to energy security. Activist group Follow This said it had co-filed the resolutions with six major institutional investors, managing $1.3 trillion in assets ahead of the annual general meetings of BP, Chevron, ExxonMobil and Shell next year. In the resolutions, the investors call on the companies to set targets to reduce by 2030 greenhouse gas emissions, including those from fuel sold to customers known as Scope 3 emissions, which account for the vast majority of the sector's pollution. Investors have in recent years ramped up pressure on the oil and gas sector to help tackle climate change and the follow this climate related resolutions have drawn growing support among shareholders. However, last year the efforts largely sputtered as investors turned their focus more to higher energy prices and energy security following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Right now, Calcine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. BP, Shell and Chevron have all set some 2030 greenhouse emissions reduction targets that include Scope 3, though Follow This said they are not aligned with the United Nations' ambitions to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. Exxon has yet to set any 2030 Scope 3 target. The group of investors co-filing the resolutions includes Edmund D. Rothschild Asset Management, De Groof Peter Kem Asset Management, and Acmea Asset Management. Follow This did not provide the names of the other backers. Shell, BP and European peers including Total Energies and NI have set out strategies and targets to slash emissions to net zero by 2050 by reducing oil and gas output and growing low carbon and renewable energy businesses. In the United States, 2022 saw a wave of efforts driven by Republican politicians and right-leaning investors to focus executives' attention away from environmental, social or governance themes. Activist investor Strive Asset Management, for instance, is seeking a shareholder vote at the springtime meeting of Chevron to reverse a Scope 3 emissions reduction mandate. Exxon and Chevron have in the past successfully blocked attempts to file climate resolutions with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Alright, that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine.
Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and this is Calgine TV's Trending News. Bonza, Australia's new and only independent low-cost airline, takes to the skies today for the first time. The new airline is hoping to enable Australians to explore more of their own backyard at low-cost prices. Bonza's initial route map includes 27 routes to 17 destinations. 93% of Bonza routes are not currently served by any airline and 96% not currently served by a low-cost carrier. The only place to book direct is on the Fly Bonza app. Today's historic flight is said to be a game-changer for both tourism markets as well as friends and family who can ditch long drives in place of a direct flight. CEO of Bonza, Tim Jordan, says today's milestone flight comes at a time where demand is high for Aussies to explore their own backyard. He says he's thrilled to deliver on Bonza's promise of stimulating new tourism markets by serving underserved regional communities. He also revealed that since going on sale days earlier, Aussies embrace the opportunity to book a seat on the app with over 10,000 seats sold. The onboard experience includes an all Aussie menu with items ordered on demand from the Fly Bonza app and delivered directly to customers' seats. Local menu partners were also invited on today's flight with food and drink suppliers across the country to join future Bonza inaugurals closest to home. The Sunshine Coast Airport will be the home base for Bonza, signalling a new era for the airport and wider region. And over the next 12 months, they will see an additional 772,000 seats into the region, which will generate more than $86 million in visitor expenditure. That's the latest trending business news from Calkine TV. I'm Rachel, signing off for now. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage, from Calkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcon Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcon Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. South Korea on Monday flagged a deeper economic slowdown than expected at least through the first half of next year and extended sales tax breaks on some fuel oil products and passenger cars by a few months. The government is expected later this week to announce its economic policy strategies for next year, which will be the first four-year statement for President Yoon suk yeols administration since its launch in May. South Korea's economy, the fourth largest in Asia, relies heavily on exports ranging from cars and ships to chips and smartphones. It's widely expected to see growth fall below 2% next year from close to 3% this year. The central bank last month cut its projection for next year's economic growth to 1.7% from the previous 2.1% in its scheduled revision, citing falling exports and the resultant reduction likely in corporate investment. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe.
Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. As the economy now has to rely more on domestic consumption to offset cooling export demand, the Finance Ministry has extended by as much as six months tax breaks on fuel oil products and passenger car sales beyond their original end 2022 expiry. The Ministry is due to unveil its 2023 economic projections and strategies on Wednesday. President Yoon, struggling against low approval ratings, says exports are the best choice for the manufacturing heavy country to overcome its slump. The problem is that China, South Korea's top export market, is facing its own problems as its economy feels the impact of years of strict controls to fight COVID-19. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkai Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. In a year marked by global monetary tightening, recession concerns and a conflict in Ukraine, many stocks have performed quite well. In this video, we're going to take a look at one such stock that has gained more than 500% since the 1st of January 2022. Turkish Airlines has gained around 544% on a year-to-date basis as of the 16th of December. Turk Havagilari is a Turkey-based company which provides passenger and cargo air transportation services. It operates under the following business segments, which are air transport, which consists of mainly domestic and international passenger and cargo air transportation and technical maintenance services, aircraft repair and infrastructure support related Related to the aviation sector. In 2022, Turkish cargo continued its strong growth trend over the last decade by building on its market share gains during the pandemic. Their incorporation increased its cargo revenue by 140% during the first nine months of 2022 compared to the same period in 2019. According to the International Air Transport Association, Turkish cargo has strengthened its success by ranking fourth among air cargo carriers in August. In February of this year, Turkish cargo moved cargo operations to its highly technological new hub, Smartest. Turkish Airlines finished the third quarter of 2022 with a 1.5 billion USD net profit. The company's total revenue during the third quarter of the year was 6.1 billion USD, surpassing the same period in 2019 by 52%. Cargo revenues increased by 110% compared to the same period in 2019 and were recorded as approximately 880 million American dollars. In the first nine months of the year, their incorporation carried 54 million passengers, reaching 96% of the 2019 level. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Additionally, in the nine months of 2022, Turkish Airlines ranked first among the European network carriers in terms of flights, according to the European Organization for the Safety of Air Navigation. The company has also decided to purchase six A350 to A900 type passenger aircraft from Airbus to be delivered this year and next. Now you can leave a comment below, you can like and subscribe to our channel and you can press the bell icon for video notifications. I'm Rachel for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, 
the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Calchine Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today, I'm speaking with Mr. Iggy Tan. He's the Managing Director of Altec Chemicals. Now, the company has already secured land for its upcoming battery anode material plant in Germany. Here to tell us more is Iggy Tan. Good to speak with you today. Good morning, and thanks for having me. Looking forward to hearing more about Altec's latest move. So now Altec has recently wrapped up the preliminary feasibility study for its German battery anode material plant. Iggy, can you tell me what were the major findings of this study? Yeah, as you know, uh, just a bit of the background. Uh, as you know, there is a push to get uh, more silicon in uh, lithium ion batteries uh, to get the energy density up. And last year we announced that we were successful at uh, producing 30% higher energy uh, lithium ion batteries. And uh, this year we have now progressed to the, the commercial aspect of that uh, game changing technology. And we announced the uh, pre feasibility study for a, a 10,000 ton per annum uh, salumina anode uh, plant to be built in Germany. Uh, just very quickly, the capital investment is about 95 million US dollars, so not a very large capital investment with a, ex, uh, very attractive returns with a net present value of around 507 US million dollars uh, and an internal rate of return uh, at about 40%. Uh, and it should generate around 63 million US dollars, uh, million US dollars per annum. Uh, during its uh, operating life. So very attractive returns, not a very large capital cost, and consequently uh, the uh, the board has decided to uh, progress to a definitive feasibility study. That's fantastic news. And the financial figures from the pre-feasibility study are very pleasing. So what will be the next course of action on this project? Yeah, so we are um, advancing on the commercial side and uh, in order to do that, we have uh, committed to build a uh, pilot plant uh, in uh, Saxony, Germany. Uh, and the reason for the pilot plant is we want to be able to produce uh, larger commercial size samples uh, of the salumina anode, which is essentially uh, silicon and graphite uh, with our alumina coating uh, combine as a product called Salumina Anodes and the pilot plan will be able to produce commercial samples that we can then send to uh, downstream customers to do their qualification process. So um, at least 30% higher energy lithium ion batteries uh, is the, uh, the objective and it's really game changing technology for the lithium ion battery industry. So we have already purchased the land in Germany. Uh, we are now progressing with the pilot plan and the DFS uh, and we also have uh, a two very strong German feedstock suppliers. So uh, our, our partners are SGL Carbon, which is uh, one of the largest graphite producers in, uh, in Europe, as well as Ferroglobe, one of the largest silicon producers in Europe as well. So it's very important for us uh, to be positioned in Europe as well as sourcing um, materials for the salumina anode material from European suppliers. 
Well, it all sounds very promising, and it seems as though we could be seeing a significant breakthrough in the technology. Iggy, would you be able to just explain in a little more detail about the silicon barrier? Yeah, um, very interestingly, um, in Tesla's uh, last battery day, they've announced that uh, they want to get silicon in their lithium ion batteries to get this step change in energy density, which then reduces the cost of lithium ion batteries to well below $100 per kilowatt hour. And the silicon has 10 times the energy density compared to graphite. So for a lay person, there are 10 times more sites that the lithium can stick on in the silicon compared to graphite. So silicon is a very promising anode material. Now, if it's such a promising anode material, why isn't it being used in commercial batteries today? And you mentioned the silicon barrier, is that silicon expands 300% in volume during the charging and discharge of the battery and it fractures and uh, it causes swelling and delamination so there's a big problem for for a lithium ion battery the other problem is that the uh, first cycle loss is also very large basically absorbs uh, a lot of lithium on its first charge and then makes it inactive now because of those two problems um, a lot of companies have been trying to resolve this silicon problem and our company uh, uses high purity alumina technology. We basically coat the silicon particle with alumina and we coat the graphite particle with alumina. And we find that resolves the problem of uh, a, a, a volume expansion and fracturing. So by doing that, we essentially crack the silicon code and we have produced 30% um, higher energy lithium batteries but more importantly, they're very stable. We've gone and uh, uh, tested the batteries in uh, long-term uh, charge and discharge cycles, uh, and they're very, very stable. So very exciting technology. Uh, we believe it's game-changing technology for the lithium-ion battery industry. Absolutely. Um, as you mentioned there, there are other battery anode producers that have been using silicon in their anode material. Now, how is your silicon anode material different from others? Yeah, I, I guess the way the industry has been trying to resolve this battery, uh, this expansion problem, is they've gone to very tiny silicon particles, um, essentially uh, nanotechnology. Uh, and, and that sort of resolves the, the expansion problem, but the problem is that the cost to get to nanotechnology is very expensive. So any benefit from any energy den increase in density uh, is negated by the extra cost of the, the silicon. So what we embarked on was using regular size um, silicon particles uh, and which then reduces the cost uh, dramatically, but using our HPA coating technology uh, to resolve this expansion and first cycle loss problem. Very exciting times. And just looking back to your Germany development as well, are there any offtake agreements from German or any other European companies? Yeah, so the, really that's our next phase of the DFS is where we, uh, um, we want to convert that um, interest into uh, offtake. At the moment we have uh, some NDAs with uh, two large German automakers uh, and we have an NDA with a, a European battery maker. Now we in the in the next phase will want to convert that to more secure offtake for the product uh, and we are very focused on Europe. Uh, our belief is that the lithium-ion battery story will be about Europe in the next two decades. Uh, as you know lithium-ion batteries about was about Japan, Korea, and China in the past. We believe that the lithium ion battery will be about Europe in the next uh, coming time. Now, the reason for that is really driven by EU uh, CO2 emission standards. And so consequently, all the uh, automakers in Europe have announced to go all electric by 2030 or 2035. 
So essentially, after that period of time, all car manufacturers in Europe will be producing electric vehicles, only electric vehicles. Now, uh, so there's something like 600 gigawatts of battery producing capacity that have been announced to meet that demand. And uh, if you follow lithium batteries, you would also follow that 600,000 tons per annum of graphite will be required for those batteries. And I guess that's where our product sits in. We are producing a super graphite anode material with that silicon. So very exciting demand coming up and that's why we really focus uh, in Europe. Absolutely, it's an extremely fast moving space to be working in. Thank you so much for your time today, Iggy. Thank you for having me. Thank you and best of luck with the moving forward. And that was Iggy Tan, Managing Director of Alta Chemicals. If you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Calchi Media, so make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel, reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Calchine. Right now, Calchine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcon Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcon Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Cyber Mutual insurer Miris has received an operating license from Belgian regulators and will start offering insurance from January 1st. It's said on Wednesday as it looks to capitalise on increasing demand for cyber cover due to rising attacks. The new insurer has signed up 12 European corporate clients and is talking to some 40 others about joining. Chief Operating Officer Mark Pollard said by phone. Belgian chemicals group Solvay is one of the insurer's founding members, a Solvay spokesperson said by email. Right now, Calcine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Miris will provide additional cover for companies whose cyber insurance options are scarce and expensive due to mounting losses, Pollard said. The amount of capacity big insurers are offering has been reducing. Premiums are increasing. It's like turning a tap off. Global cyber attacks increased by 28% in the third quarter compared with the same period in 2021, according to software firm Checkpoint. Pollard declined to confirm trade press reports that Miris's other initial members include Airbus, BASF and Michelin. The companies did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Thanks for watching. Please do like, share, comment, keep watching for more market insights and business news. Sage for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Germany's finance ministry expects activity in Europe's biggest economy to remain subdued during the fourth quarter of this year and first quarter of next and sees declining inflation rates during 2023, according to its monthly report. 
The report stated that overall, economic developments are expected to remain subdued in the winter half year. The report continued to state, however, that relatively stable labour market developments and the government's relief measures are providing supportive impetus. It also added that current estimates pointed to declining inflation rates, albeit at a raised level next year. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Tax revenues rose 2% in November from the same month last year to 55.95 billion euros. In the first 11 months of the year, the tax take increased by 8.7%. In an interview in the report, Finance Minister Christian Linder said his response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine had led to higher debt levels than he would have liked. This, however, was unavoidable as a special response to challenges such as soaring energy prices were required. Since Linda took over the finance ministry a year ago, debt has risen to about 500 billion euros, including a 200 billion euro protective shield against high energy prices and 100 billion euros to modernize the armed forces. However, the minister said he aimed to return to a sustainable, stable financial policy in the long term. Alright, that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Welcome to another edition of Expert Talks. Thank you for joining us here on Calkine TV. I'm Sage. Today we're bringing you Laurent Billiers, Sales Director of the APEC region for Talon One. And for some background, e-commerce and digital sales is a competitive space. And today's guest is an enterprise-ready platform to support businesses with digital advertising campaigns, limiting the need for coding in order to stay competitive and gamifying the process, offering a leading edge. So I'm keen to find out more. Excited to bring you live today, Laurent Billiers, a sale director for APAC region at Talon One. Welcome to the show, Laurent. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, we're so keen to share your insights in this innovative space. Let's get started. So, Laurent, why are brands turning to technological solutions to run incentives and rewards? And what is a microservice? And what is a promotion engine, please? Well, it's a question every engineering team is asking themselves at the moment. Should I build my own technology or should I outsource it to a software as a service company, what we call SaaS? This is especially true regarding incentives and rewards, as every brand is currently launching a loyalty and referral program. Why reinvent the wheel when you could buy it off the shelf and allocate your development resources to your core product? This is why brands are increasingly investing in tasks. To be microservice oriented is like buying all the ingredients separately to make your own pizza, instead of buying a ready-made pizza. At a time where brands need to differentiate themselves, they have to provide a unique experience. They need to buy ingredients separately. And this is made possible thanks to microservices. As such, Talon One is a microservice oriented solution. We provide a rules engine to power all the promotion logic to our client. The way it works is quite simple. If your customer does this, then you should receive this reward or this incentive. And we work with leading brands to manage all their coupons, discounts, bundles, loyalty, and referral programs. And if I remember correctly, we are currently having 4 billion coupons in our database today. 
Well, that's a very big number. Thank you so much for breaking it down for us. And it sounds like a very innovative um, platform that you have there. So how brands are gamifying the user experience through incentive and reward schemes, please? So there is a big shift happening in the industry. Before, every brand used to rely on discounting to increase sales and woo customer back. Now, digital leaders are now focusing on making sure users achieve specific milestones. And to make sure they complete those milestones, they use incentives and rewards. And what is really interesting is brands are now asking their users to work for their reward instead of giving it automatically. For example, you'll now be asked to refer three friends to a brand to become a gold member and get free delivery. Before, you would just add your item to the cart, wait two days, and eventually you would receive a coupon uh, to get free delivery. Mission and challenges are also becoming mainstream. If you look at Afterpay, they will reward you when you make a first and second transaction, if you buy from a sustainable business or from a small business. And in the more advanced use cases, brands are also launching time-sensitive missions. We see this a lot happening in quick commerce, like make a purchase once a week for four weeks in a row and get free delivery for the next four weeks. That's amazing. And I think customers actually appreciate these loyalty rewards. Um, I've heard the stats are something phenomenal, like 3.3 billion um, American users alone are joining these uh, customer incentive programs. So that sounds great because it allows inactive accounts to get engaged with platforms again as well by incentivizing and offering rewards. So Lauren, please tell us more about Talon One's APIs. How can businesses benefit from your product range? So Talon One is an API first company, meaning we are designed to integrate easily with other systems which talk to each other using APIs. For example, if you add a pair of shoes to the cart on the iconic while using a coupon code, Talon One will receive the event via API evaluate if it triggers a promotion campaign, and return the relevant effects. These effects can take many forms. We might add 10% discount on the product, add a free product to the cart, or give $10 cash back. Being API first is also crucial, as we need to interact with many systems. We will communicate with the website of the customer, but also with the email provider, the push notification provider, the product analytics tool, and the customer data platform. And here, scalability is key as all of this needs to happen in real time. Talon One will process the API request in less than 100 milliseconds, even during Black Friday, when we discount millions of orders. And being API first also, allow, also allows for a lot of flexibility. Brands have been very creative in the way they use our rules engine to create any kind of incentives and rewards. Actually, just on that note, just for our viewers out there who are not familiar with the term API, could you just expand on that for us, what an API actually is? Sure. So the API is the ability to send a piece of data from one software to another. Think of it as a telephone line. So to communicate, well, before you would place phone call, but now you are using API to pass, like let's say, a coupon code from Talon1 to the email that you would receive in your Gmail. Right, so it's like a telegraphic transfer and that's actually been happening since the 1800s, so it's like a new name for something that's been happening for centuries, I guess. Is that right? Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. So do interested clients have to use the full suite of products to benefit and is there a free trial period? So a principle in Talon One is that all the solutions are available to customers at every level. Nothing is gated. <clears throat> the flexibility, scalability, and intuitive design of the promotion engine means that whatever use case they want to launch, they will immediately start benefiting from using Talon1. What happens frequently is that a brand comes to Talon1 saying, I have a fraud problem with my coupon and referral program, but they end up using us for discounting and loyalty. And even more frequently, they come with 10 campaign ideas they want to launch right now, but end up launching 100 campaigns just because of how easy it is. And that's a key reason why digital leaders use Talon1. We can easily help them create the immediate use case they have in mind, but we also empower them for the future campaigns. Regarding the free trial, if they name drop you, I'll make it happen, I promise. <laughs> Sounds great. So you can fully customize a program that would suit an e-commerce business to, for them to benefit the most out of your platform. Is, is that correct? Yeah, completely. We work with, uh, let's say, Jimmy Brings in Australia. We work with leading fintech. We were with leading uh, malls, uh, food delivery company. 
banks, insurance. We work with any company that runs promotion. And right now, well, everybody's running promotion, even TV networks. Yes, I saw some big brand names on your website, like Ticketmaster, that's a massive business. Um, so we're coming to the end of the discussion now. E-commerce is becoming more competitive, just like you say, and more transparent as well. People want to know what mechanics are running a business these days. And how will Talon One help clients to stay legally compliant? Are there plans to introduce clients to the new era of blockchain as well? So we are a German company, so we know a bit about data privacy that are extremely stringent in Australia. The great thing about Talon One is you don't need to use personally identifying information to make it work, what we call PII, which is everybody's afraid of this. Uh, and we will even host all the data of our clients on Australian servers to make sure they remain compliant. So there is no issue around this. Mm -hmm. Regarding blockchain and Web3, this is definitely a trend. Look at Nike and McDonald's, we already have NFTs and selling digital products. So an NFT is a unique image you can buy on the blockchain. When will they bundle digital and physical products? I think it's just a matter of time. But as an example, Dolce Gabbana, they're already selling digital suits. And if you buy one, you get a free real suit as a reward. So it's definitely coming. Um, and if you push it a bit further, it makes sense for customers to be able to resell what they earn by being loyal to a brand. I don't think we are far away from brands awarding NFT badges instead of regular loyalty badge. And eventually, I should be able to resell my platinum status on Qantas, including the perks attached to it. Blockchain will allow this by enabling unicity and trustability of transactions. Wow, thanks so much for filling us in about what you are doing to uh, help us with this emerging era of blockchain and this digital era that's really allowing people to earn some real liquidity from their businesses. And funny you mentioned Dolce & Gabbana because NFTs are like a very high status fashion symbol these days. <laughs> so it sounds fun. Exactly. This is what everybody will buy to look cool in the metaverse. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for being available and sharing your insights, Lauren. We do appreciate your time. Thank you so much for inviting me. I hope I come back soon and visit the office in Sydney. Yes, best of luck with the goals moving forward. Bye. Thank you. And if you've just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion with Laurent Billiers. He's a sales director for the APAC region for Talon One. Please watch the full interview on Kalkai Media's YouTube channel and keep watching for more of these excellent expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. An airline company must end up with a majority stake in ITA Airways after the privatisation process of the state-owned carrier is concluded, an Italian government decree seen by Reuters said. In the meantime, the Treasury should have a say on the new shareholders, the decree stipulated. Right now, Calcane is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Sources had previously told Reuters the decree passed on Wednesday was aimed at facilitating the full privatisation of ITA, which was created last year from the ashes of the failed Alitalia starting with the sale of an initial minority stake. And Germany's Lufthansa is the front runner to buy into ITA, sources have said. Thanks so much for watching. Please do like, share, comment. Keep watching for more market insights and business news. Sage for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, 
and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Chipmaker Micron Technology Incorporated on Wednesday, December 21, forecast a much steeper than expected second quarter loss and said that it will lay off around 10% of its workforce next year, citing a nagging glut in the semiconductor market. Micron Chief Executive Sanjay Marotra said that due to the significant supply and demand mismatch entering calendar year 2023, the company expects that profitability will remain challenged throughout 2023. Micron had about 48,000 employees worldwide as of the 1st of September. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Micron reporting earnings on Wednesday forecast second quarter revenue of 3.8 billion US dollars, plus or minus 200 million dollars above Wall Street estimates. But it forecasts a loss of 62 cents per share, plus or minus 10 cents, much steeper than analyst estimates for a 30 cent loss. Micron shares fell over 1% in extended trading. They've also fallen by about 45% so far this year. Red hot inflation, rising interest rates, Geopolitical tensions and COVID-19 lockdowns in China have led businesses and consumers to rein in expenses, hitting the PC and smartphone market and in turn, the business of chip makers. The situation was a quick U-turn from chip shortages last year that hit everything from laptops to car makers. Micron said on Wednesday that its investments in fiscal year 2023 would now be adjusted down to $7 billion to $7.5 billion and that it would be significantly reducing CapEx plans in fiscal year 2024. It invested $12 billion in the 2022 financial year. Micron, the first major chipmaker to alert the market of the downturn over the summer, previously said it would be cutting investments in 2023. It was not clear what its previous 2024 investment plans were, however. Revenue for the first quarter ending on November 30 fell by about 47% year-on-year to $4.09 billion. It had a net loss of $195 million or 18 cents per share, compared with a profit of $2.31 billion or $2.04 per share a year earlier. Alright, well that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine Media. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Welcome to Expert Talks by Calkine TV. Sage here. And today's guest is Lucia Gallardo. She's a co-founder of Eternal's NFT Impact Project. And the team of artists behind this impact project have created metamorphic NFTs inspired by the Amazon rainforest. Designed for engagement, the owners of the NFT become the guardian of the digital space and the digital object evolves over time with three different states. Now I'm keen to find out more. We will hold that thought and let's introduce today's guest who is Lucia Gallardo, co-founder of Eternal's NFT Amazon Impact Project. This sounds like an amazing project, Lucia. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to tell you all about it. Yeah, we really are keen because you don't hear of too many metamorphic NFT projects out there. So you've definitely got a space of your own there. So we'd love to hear more about the innovative brand. Sure. Um, honestly, it happened a little bit like uh, an experiment. We were guided at first by a few questions because we saw the NFT market really hit a, a strong, let's call it a bull run. Um, and we were just 
curious about how NFTs could be pushed further. And we wanted to uh, test, you know, what they could do in terms of evolution and sort of change according to real time data. And then we wanted to co connect that data to engagement. We wanted to sort of uh, give people a reason to stay connected over time to a particular cause um, so that, you know, they could demonstrate their passion for the environment in this case, uh, or uh, they could sort of showcase their commitment in terms of how much they are putting into our community and see their NFT be a reflection of that. So, you know, we were interested in um, making it as multidimensional as possible. We wanted you to love it because it's artful and we wanted you to have it as a collectible. We wanted you to be able to play a game with it. We wanted uh, you to be able to use it as a, a way to measure your personal impact. Um, and then on top of that, we wanted it to be, you know, dynamic and have, you know, more, more of a, uh, a reaction to your personal behavior in terms of value. So, you know, if you take this collectible and you uh, sell it immediately, you flip it uh, as, as what is known in the NFT market, you know, and it's in state one, that has a particular value associated to it. The, you know, the market will set the floor price for it. Uh, but if you take it and engage with it, engage with the community and evolve it into a different state that has more benefits and is visually much more complex then your behavior has had a direct influence in the value. And I think that that's a very uh, exciting thing to sort of add more layers of sovereignty into this financial instrument, which is ultimately what, you know, the decentralization of finance is about. So we're very excited about the project. Uh, it, it, you know, we're donating 55% of the proceeds to Rainforest Partnership, which is a nonprofit that's been doing excellent work for over 14 years uh, in biodiversity hotspots across the Amazon and now Mexico. Um, and, uh, you know, we've also pledged 1% of our uh, secondary sales to offsetting the carbon emissions that we set off with the project in perpetuity uncapped. Uh, so we know the project will become carbon negative at one point, and uh, after that, we'll just be offsetting uh, other projects in the metaverse. So we're also uh, very excited to have made that commitment, um, and it's just been a great experience all around. We're super excited to to launch it, and you know we can't see what can't wait to see what people think of it. Exactly, and thanks so much for sharing that with us. It's a very exciting time to connect with your brand. And over the last couple of years of the pandemic era, we've seen a lot of value shifts actually. So it's really uh, ironic that your product is actually um, taking people's nurturing of their physical you know, or their material um, belongings and actually giving that value because it seems like we're really going back to basics now and actually working out what our mission is in life and, and what are we doing here. So thanks again. So you've visited the Amazon. Is, would that be correct? Um, I personally have not, but I grew up in a rainforest. It just wasn't the Amazon. Um, so I grew up in the second largest rainforest in Latin America. Um, and it's, uh, it's just a something that I naturally grew up with. The, our gaming team did grow up next to the Amazon. We have uh, another team member that is currently living in a rainforest in Southeast Asia. So actually our team is quite scattered around the world. Rainforests cover approximately 6% of the Earth's surface and people would be very surprised to figure out that actually they might have a rainforest very, very close to them. If you're in Scotland, by the way, uh, one of the world's oldest rainforests is located there. It's per one, personally one of my favorites. I have been to that one um, and it's just incredibly uh, lovely. So I think we all uh, came together because we care very deeply about what's happening to our planet, what's happening to rainforests. You know, in the past years, uh, we've lost about half of the world's rainforest. So we're down to 6% um, from what used to be 14%. And so, uh, so it's just really important to us to have that emotional connection. But also it was important for us to convey that emotional connection uh, to uh, to collectors, because even if you've never set foot in a rainforest, no matter where you are in the world, uh, your every seventh breath is actually facilitated by a rainforest. They're super important to our ability to exist and, you know, our ability to regulate climate. And so we wanted to give people, you know, this feeling of you can walk through it, you can hear it, uh, the you can see it, you can feel it. Uh, the uh, NFTs are actually connected to the Amazon in real time. So when it rains in the rainforest, it'll rain in your NFT. Uh, when you know there's sunlight, when there's a change in skylight, so if it's nighttime or if it's daytime, all of these things you can experience through the game, you can experience through your NFT. And so it's just intended to really build that emotional 
uh, emotional connection. And you were right on point with your comment because when we set out to do this, we, you know, decided that if we were going to be funding the work um, and of the communities that we're supporting, these indigenous communities that have been doing this work for a really long time, we had to really adopt their ethos around the economics of it too. And they view a rainforest as a public good, the ones that we're working with. And so um, it wasn't for us to build a model, an economic model that was consumptive or extractive. We really wanted to build something that redefined what that underlying economic uh, incentive was. And for us, it meant engagement, commitment to rainforest protection as a cause. It meant your ability to amplify this cause, your ability to support this cause. And um, that is, in fact, a, a different type of economics that we're hoping to see more of in the NFT space in the future. Yes, that is so true. And, and it's great to see so many of these crypto protocols actually getting behind the environmental initiative and growing trees. Um, may I please ask you which mm -hmm. blockchain this NFT is on, if it is? Sure. Uh, so we we are minting on the Ethereum blockchain. That was a, a very conscious choice that we've made. Um, we wanted a, a blockchain that people could recognize the name of and feel a little bit of trust toward that because it's been around for a really long time. It has a very large developer community. It has, you know, very beginner friendly uh, platforms such as Nifty Gateway, which is the marketplace that we are using as a partner. And to be frank, they've been really supportive of this project, the technology that complicated their uh, their smart contract requirements a little bit because we needed to the ability to you know change the NFT in your wallet and so they were excellent about working with us uh, in order to make everything happen you can you know pay in crypto you can pay in fiat it's a very smooth uh, onboarding process so we're very happy um, with Nifty Gateway and very proud to be working with them um, and then we've taken additional measures to uh, sort of offset that ecological footprint that Ethereum may have. Um, and we were able to work with our company in France called Tresorio, which helped us reduce our carbon uh, foot em emissions from 71 tons about uh, down to 6.8 tons. So we've done a lot of work in recycling the heat that we're emitting, um, turning it into hot water, giving that hot water to social housing units across France. Uh, we've done work in building our own custom layer two uh, over Ethereum in order to manage the transactions and minimize our ecological footprint on that front as well. Um, so we've taken very big, big steps in order to make sure that uh, we're being as environmentally efficient as possible, but still operating within um, what is currently a proof of work based blockchain. Yeah, that's so great that you're gamifying the process as well through the game. Um, mm -hmm. It just makes it more fun and, and allows people to engage with the initiative. So distributed ledger technology has been utilized mm -hmm. for databases before blockchain evolved with a currency. Um, you've touched on it a bit. Could you elaborate on how values created for NFTs, please? Sure. Um, so, you know, in artwork from the perspective of uh, that people currently think about the NFT as the object itself. And so uh, we kind of uh, say, actually, the object can be anything. You can uh, you can turn, you know, a luxury bottle of wine, you can turn a, a land title, you can turn an ID, you can turn uh, an Eternals plot into an NFT, because ultimately the NFT's value is in the metadata. What you're trying to assign is um, the verifiability of ownership, the record of transactions that, that are around uh, that, val that asset that demonstrate what that traction of value might be. And so it really is this, uh, this amount of data that sort of uh, revolves around an asset that gives it more value because you're able to authentically verify you know, that chain of custody and you're able to sort of see what that market demand might be and you're able to see uh, the transactions that have uh, taken place assigning it value over time. And so really uh, what we're sort of playing around with is this idea that the more transparency and visibility we have into the market dynamics of a particular asset, um, the more we can better uh, give it value, more accurately uh, price it. And so that's really what the true value to us is uh, about NFTs as a, as a general concept. That's really interesting how this sect is building a kind of a trustless um, society. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really interesting um, aspect to crypto. So NFTs are allowing everyday people to get involved in the crypto sphere. And you were talking about the behavior earlier and how people can interact with these particular metamorphic NFTs. Could you also help us understand what the benefits of adapting behavior to include digital asset collectibles uh, can 
be for our society? And also, is swapping collectibles possible with non-fungible tokens? Yes. So um, there's definitely, it's new technology. So we're starting to see just like NFT use cases in every direction. We're seeing, you know, definitely the, the gamified NFTs are quite popular. Uh, uh, you know, Axie Infinity probably being the most well-known gaming uh, application, you know, I think uh, quite just by, by virtue of mass awareness. Mm -hmm. um, but there's many others as well. Even like brands are starting to get into this. So Louis Vuitton, for example, just launched their uh, NFT based game, uh, which is quite adorable, to be honest, and very fun. Um, there's uh, also applications in the direction of like protecting intellectual property that relates to music, uh, you know, uh, Blau being probably the most famous example uh, of consistently putting out a, a music related NFTs and doing very well. Um, but one of the things that he's doing that's special is he's allowing fans to start earning off of having invested in, in the in a particular song. So they earn royalties off of that. And so that's an example of like how value can be returned to the everyday person by simply listening to music that they've invested in um, and sort of seeing that return come back to them. Uh, you can see, you know, through the gaming environment, you can see the play to earn model, which is, you know, the more video games you play, the more you achieve, you unlock, the more you're earning back in tokens. Um, and then, you know, you can turn those tokens into, into fiat. And, um, You've seen other like a new economic models that that are just all related to your relationship with NFTs. And so, you know, these are popping up in, in the case of movies, in the case of books and literary uh, situations. You're looking at NFTs be associated with land titles or, uh, you know, my company's personally working on uh, an application in the direction of, it, of digital identity and, and using NFTs to sort of uh, track your identity in a more privacy protecting way over time. So there's really um, there's, it's, it's a very flexible technology, and I think that's really why it becomes important for people to, to just like dip their toes in the water at some point or other, um, because it's technology that is flexible enough that it could provide uh, a lot of value in very different directions over time, which means that ultimately what, what I'd like to see personally is um, you know, more sophisticated but ubiquitous cases of NFT of NFTs around the world, and obviously, the more people educate themselves about what they are, what they what they can be, where their value comes from, you know, what who's behind some of these projects, and whether those are, those projects are investable or not, um, that becomes like a very important thing for people that are you know preparing to look ahead at their financial future, um, you know, to to consider because ultimately, uh, what we've seen is that the economics of this market, um, though volatile, are still you know they're generating a fair return for a lot of people and so um you know obviously no no new technologies without risk and i think that's where a lot of the education and like measured decision making comes into play but i think you know there is a lot of value and potential value to be derived from nfts and i think um we're just getting to like the very beginning of it and you know our artwork has helped really popularize this technology for a lot of people but that's just the beginning we're starting to see very interesting use cases in different industries and i think ultimately you know we're going to be seeing membership based uh tokens we're going to be seeing loyalty points uh sort of transition onto nft based uh technology we're going to be seeing a lot of exciting um, you know, momentous uh, artwork, uh, interactive artwork, generative artwork, such as that that jo Jonas Lund created recently with Aorist, which is, um, you know, the more people interact and engage with the artwork, it, it, it algorithmically changes the artwork to reflect that. And so ultimately, it's um, taking, I think, something like 512 uh, digital artworks and reducing them down to one, which is the most valuable uh, painting, because ultimately it's the one that people engaged with the most, liked the most, reacted to the most, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so super exciting things happening all around. Yeah, for sure. And I loved how you mentioned fashion adopting this technology mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, it's definitely got a use case there. And apparently crypto is being adopted at a faster rate than the internet was. So more people are jumping on crypto than they did <laughs> on the internet when it first came out. So that's really interesting to see. I I'm excited to see where the technology will go. And it sounds like your company is really working on some interesting aspects about uh, keeping your digital twin uh, safe and closely <laughs> tracked. So be great to catch up with you once that has launched as well. Um, so keeping up to date with this discussion that we have planned, could you help us understand um, some of the real world problems that Web 3.0 can solve? Uh, the interactive technology involved with your impact project is obviously cutting edge, so we're keen to find out a bit more. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about the potential, but I also want to make sure that that, you know, it's never assumed that there's a causational relationship between impact and Web3. Um, we really, there is no causational relationship between positive social impact and any technology to be true. Uh, technology is a neutral tool and, and the more that we intentionally design, um, you know, these like reimagined uh, underlying economic incentives, the more that we intentionally look towards solving specific problems, I think um, that's where the technolo technology gets particularly interesting to me. Um, I've seen use cases that are doing really wonderful work in ocean conservation and trying to uh, sort of bring visibility to, you know, things that are under the water and therefore we might take for granted, such as our coral reefs. Um, I've seen a lot of projects try to, uh, you know, make headway in cleaning up the carbon credit market, try to add more visibility into those carbon credits, where they're coming from, what they're truly, you know, what their impact is of offsetting and what the price actually should be or, uh, you know, who is really, you know, uh, offsetting a lot to, you know, what the mechanics are around that, um, which I think could be really impactful because historically speaking, of course, uh, there's been a lot of controversy in the global carbon credit market. Um, I think that there is, you know, obviously a natural connection between uh, decentralizing finance and, in and creating more financial inclusion. As you mentioned, you know, more and more people are adopting, you know, cryptocurrency as a, as a means of pay because it's a direct form of payment. Um, there's verifiability in the, the public chain to make sure that, you know, we know uh, and trust where our money has gone and that there's a lot less intervention of people that can seize our money, which I think is really this, this um, what might be motivating a lot of people to switch on to it is this idea that, you know, it's it's censorship resistant money and essentially separating this this idea that your money, your money should be controlled or ca could be controlled by other people. So I think uh, this idea of financial sovereignty and financial empowerment is a really important one that is naturally aligned with the technology. But we're, you know, obviously, as more initiatives in digital identity are resolved, we're going to be able to provide documentation of some form, digital documentation, to identify 1.2 billion people in the world that currently don't hold any document to certify their their identity. Uh, we're looking at, you know, three over three billion people that don't currently have an access to a bank account that could be addressed by giving people direct connection to wallets that, you know, hold their money and then they can peer to peer trade it. We're looking at um, an industry that concerns itself significantly with the environment. Um, you know, a lot has been made about the energy consumption of crypto in recent months. But to be frank, it's a it's a conversation that really um, hasn't been nuanced at all, because not only do things consume uh, consume energy, but they're also using and pulling energy from particular places, the sources from which uh, the crypto industry has organically gravitated toward is to use stranded energy, uh, solar and analytic energy as primary sources. And so, uh, you know, the the fact that we're predominantly running on renewable energy is not often talked about. So, uh, you know, the fact that consumption is going to happen regardless of any anything, because everything consumes digital power these days, your phone, your laptop, an ATM, uh, you, you, you know, logging onto your bank account and, and trying to transfer money or, or a wire transfer, you going to the bank and actually, you know, making that transaction in person, all of that is computing power and blockchain does not escape that. Everything uh, is, is in that direction right now. Um, but what we can do is make sure that we are uh, just organically aligned to using renewable sources, making ourselves more energy efficient uh, on a regular basis. And the crypto industry has done this without a single you know, dollar of subsidy. We're not receiving incentives from the government or taxpayer money in order to be able to say that m the majority of our energy is coming from renewable sources, especially in the Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum cases. But, you know, the, the traditional finance sector has required taxpayer money in order to be incentivized to make those same decisions. So what we're seeing really is that the Web3 space is foundationally and philosophically really aligned with like the general social and economic and environmental well-being of the planet. And I think that that's really going to be a massive opportunity for us to build a, a better and more sustainable future. Yeah, the, the, the P2P concept of Bitcoin um, <laughs> definitely is a selling point. And I think in regards to the carbon issue and the carbon emissions for since the beginning of the um, 1800s when companies started pouring out these carbon emissions uh, or the, the middle of the 1800s um, we found that these companies weren't accountable they weren't charged for that pollution and it seems now that protocols yeah. like yours are actually 
taking um, some responsibility for the usage that you know your production is creating but really we wouldn't be here if we didn't consume energy it's just part of life isn't it so thank you so yeah. much for that it's very enlightening hearing you share your mm -hmm. insights um, as we reach the end of the discussion what do you see as a future of NFTs and in regards to acquiring NFTs I think people do require a wallet of some sort of digital wallet mm -hmm. Could you see it evolving to people just needing to scan a QR code to gain an NFT? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the type of NFT. I think there's some that are always going to require more uh, security features by virtue of the value that, that they hold. Um, so I think that it'll just be, you know, be that. There, there are versions of uh, crypto wallets that are just QR codes, right? So um, that that's the user experience. And so I think uh, we'll, we're definitely going to be able to see, you know, the, the full spectrum of security options for how people acquire these NFTs. Um, in our case, by partnering with Nifty Gateway, we actually, um, by creating an account on Nifty Gateway, you automatically get um, issued a, a Gemini wallet. So if you've never created a wallet before, you just really go through the same mechanics as you would create a new account on some social media platform. And, um, and then, you know, you receive a wallet. And so I think that that's, going to be very important moving forward to welcome more people into the space in terms of what's next um i think we are seeing that you know what uh crypto did for economics we see nfts being able to do for assets and i think that that's going to be really exciting we're starting to see use cases around um you know assigning value to goods uh, physical goods. Uh, we're sort of seeing in, in the direction of land. We're seeing in the direction of uh, loyalty points and sort of people managing the ways that brands engage um, with their consumers changing from just being, you know, dollar for dollar spend to being a lot more complex and rewarding people for, um, you know, different types of engagements across the web. Um, we're, you know, I'm particularly excited to see where the, these like community building membership based uh, tokens go as well, because one thing that we've seen is that NFTs have a very strong power to build collective or community. Um, and I think that that uh, particularly excites me because of the precedent it's setting toward um, sort of encouraging specific types of behavior and building communities around that behavior, like the Eternals is trying to do around uh, sort of environmentally protective and nurturing behavior. So uh, super excited about that. I think uh, we're only just getting started and we are starting to see a lot of more, you know, complex, sophisticated versions of the technology adding a AI to make the artwork more complex over time to be responsive to certain data. Um, and so I just think it's going to be particularly exciting to see these use cases get more sophisticated and, uh, and continue to expand in the, in the industry directions. Yes, thank you so much. You've mentioned so many great mm -hmm. use cases today in various industries. Mm -hmm. um, we really do appreciate your insights. Thanks for joining us. I know it's pretty early where you're joining us from, so we do appreciate your time. Yes. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to the next time. Yes, and best of luck with your launch. So that was a very interesting discussion if you have just joined us with the co-founder of Eternals NFT Impact Project, Lucia Gallardo. For the full interview, please head to Kalkai Media's YouTube channel and check it out. And till the next episode, please keep watching for more of these excellent live expert talks and market insights. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai Media. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to Zerocoin. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor 
to zero coin. South Korea and the United States are discussing joint planning and implementation of US nuclear operations to counter North Korea. Seoul's presidential office said on Tuesday, January 3, although US President Joe Biden said there would be no joint nuclear exercises. The statement came shortly after Biden said the United States was not discussing joint nuclear exercises with South Korea, seeming to contradict earlier remarks by South Korean President Yoon Suk-yul in an interview with a local newspaper. Yoon's press secretary, Kim eun hye said Biden had no choice but to say no because he was simply asked if the two countries were discussing nuclear war games, whereas joint nuclear exercises can only be held between nuclear weapon states. A senior US administration official reiterated Biden's comments, saying that joint nuclear exercises with Seoul would be extremely difficult because Seoul is not a nuclear power, but that the Allies are looking at enhanced information sharing, joint contingency planning, and an eventual tabletop exercise. Both presidents have asked their teams after a meeting in Cambodia in November to explore ways to address North Korea's recent actions and statements, which have caused increasing concern according to officials. Neither side has finalised the timing of the planned tabletop exercises, but they would take place in the not too distant future and cover scenarios beyond nuclear situations, according to officials. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. A National Security Council spokesperson said in a statement that the United States is committed to providing extended deterrence and that the Allies are working on an effective coordinated response to a range of scenarios, including nuclear use by North Korea. All right, that's all for this video, but don't forget to like, share and comment. And for more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Fundamental analysis determines a company's inherent worth by examining its financial, economic, qualitative and quantitative variables. It's commonly used when investors want to make a long-term investment in a company. However, in exceptional scenario investing, such as buybacks, rights issues, mergers and acquisitions and much more, fundamental analytical skills are needed to benefit in the near term. The fundamental analysis enables an investor to drown out the short-term sounds surrounding the firm and focus on the long-term potential. For fundamental analysis to make a spending choice, several criteria must be considered. The general economic state, the performance of the asset or the company's relevant sectors, geopolitical or internal political repercussions, market competitiveness and many other aspects are examples of macroeconomic considerations. Furthermore, for fundamental analysis, it's necessary to examine the company's top management or executive team. Meanwhile, some microeconomic factors such as demand and supply, the labour market, manufacturing and transportation expenses and so on should also be considered. Analysts might differentiate one company or asset from another through fundamental research, regardless of their industries, market value or other factors. Fundamental analysts often search for executive team members, their backgrounds, past experience, accomplishments or failures and so on while evaluating the management team. 
Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. To analyze the company's performance, fundamental analysis, examine for profit or loss statements, cash flow, sales growth, and other critical indicators in its filings. All of these characteristics distinguish a fundamental analysis from technical analysis, which primarily focuses on quantitative data. On the other hand, fundamental analysis seek quantitative and qualitative data. So what do you think? You can like and subscribe to our channel. You can press the bell icon for video notifications and you can leave a comment below. I'm Rachel for Kalki Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Welcome to another edition of Expert Talks here on Calkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Mackenzie Hall, a nutrition specialist at Nutritional Growth Solutions. So Nutritional Growth Solutions distributes its formula worldwide under different brand names. And this ASX listed nutrition company creates nutritional supplements that are scientifically formulated by pediatric doctors, patented and clinically proven to support growth development in children specifically. So here to tell us more is Mackenzie Hall, a nutrition specialist at Nutritional Growth Solutions. Welcome to the show, Mackenzie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We are so glad to have you with us. So NGS defines itself as positioned at the crossroads of medicine and nutrition. Could you help us understand this a bit by elaborating on this distinct blend that is helping children gain height? Yes, definitely. So our formula that was clinically studied to aid in height gain was formulated by uh, pediatricians, dietitians, and researchers after they saw an influx in children who were sh of short stature and didn't want human growth hormone as um, a therapy. So they were like, well, let's create this cool formula that we can, we can study and figure out if it'll help with growth, taking their nutritional knowledge. And the study did show that children three to nine did benefit in both height and weight gain from the formula. Oh, that sounds amazing. Thank you for sharing your results from your study. Can you provide a little more detail on how and which specific combinations of micro and macronutrients do influence growth in children? And how is NGS a specialist in this space, please? Yes, so for the macronutrients, um, the most important thing is that kids are getting sufficient calories to grow. They do need um, an increase in calories. Kids require a lot of energy. Um, for our product specifically, the macronutrients uh, that we selected were the high quality whey protein, which was found to be the most effective protein source for growth. And then our fat source is from sunflower oil, which was shown to be good for brain de development. And then our carbohydrate source is really fast absorbing, which is important for kids because it's easily digested. And a lot of kids do have, a tr have trouble um, processing complex carbohydrates. Um, then for the micronutrients, which are the vitamins and minerals that are really important for growth are, you know, the calcium for growth plate development, the zinc, which aids in calcium absorption, um, iron, which carries oxygen throughout the body and aids in melabotic function, and then vitamin A, D, and C, which contribute to immunity. Thank you. So how is NGS a specialist in this space? 
Yeah, so NGS is a specialist, um, I'd say really because of our medical board and the creators of our project, they do have patients and they do treat children. And that's what, that's how this product became about. They were really looking for a solution for families and then with our clinical study, um, a lot of supplements aren't clinically studied, which we take so much pride in. And it really just gives confidence to parents that um, NGS's products are going to work, they're successful, and they're really doing something great for their kids to fill in those nutritional gaps. That sounds amazing. It sounds like the support you need when you are a parent of a young child because children can't really express themselves, you know, articulately mm. to let you know what's going on. So you want to know they're getting the best. Thank you, Mackenzie. So how long does it take for NGS's shake formula to show results in children who consume the recommended dose? And is there any dose response relation? Yes, so it is, a, the clinical study was dose dependent. So we qualified good consumers as kids that were consuming the shake at least once a day. And there was statistical significant growth at, measured at both six months and 12 months, with 12 months being the optimal time to see results. Thank you. And uh, the clinical trial results for NGS's products suggest that there is no increase in body mass index in kids who consume NGS Shakes formula. What does that signify, please? Yes, so um, basically what it means is that the, the height that was gained, there was proportional weight gain. So it's non-obesogenic weight that was gained. So there was no increase in body mass index and all weight gained was proportional to the additional unexpected height. Right, and I suppose that might also relate to the um, number of sugars and, and saccharines that are in the product as well? Yes, we have very low added sugar, especially compared to other kids' shakes that are on the market, um, simply because we just don't think it's important. And kids' palates really do, they, they are developing for other flavors, not just you know the sweetness. And we made a really yummy shake that kids are responding to without all that additional added sugar. So it doesn't taste like a dessert, but it definitely, um, it isn't unpleasant at all. Well, it sounds like it must be easier to digest as well then. So various research reports have stated that 80% of height is determined by genetics. So how successful are nutritional supplements in bringing positive results? It's a really good question. So 80% is dictated, final adult height is dictated by genetics, but that remaining 20% is dictated by environmental factors, nutrition being the main one of that. So if you have a, ch a child who's a really picky eater, who um, is taking appetite suppressant medication or has food aversions and really needs to fill those nutritional gaps, that remaining 20% will be completely um, just benefit from nutritional supplementation, especially if they're not eating very much. It's important to look for supplements that um, won't make them not hungry, won't fill them up before meals because most supplements aren't a replacement for meals. They're just really used as a tool to, to fill that remaining 20% for optimal growth. Thank you. So NGS has just released its newest range, Healthy Heights Kids Protein. Can you tell us more about this range and what separates it from NGS's Grow Daily product range, please? Yeah, we are so excited to launch Kids Protein. So as we were just talking about, our Grow Daily products were our clinically studied products um, for very specific um, age and for kids that are struggling with growth or with weight. And our Kids Protein is just the everyday perfect shake. It's a multivitamin with 18 added vitamins and minerals and a boost of protein and designed for kids 2 to 18. So instead of just the clinically studied formula, which has really specific vitamins and minerals to aid in growth, this is just an all around vitamins and minerals you need to develop, to grow, just to be healthy. Um, and it's really just a tool for parents just to know it's, you know, it's so confusing, like what should I give my kid, what's good? And just so they can feel confident that they're giving their kids a boost of vitamins and minerals during the day. That sounds fantastic. So if a child does suffer allergies, um, is this still a product that would suit them? Yeah, so our grow day, or our kids' protein products, they are gluten-free, um, they're free of all nut allergens, but and we, do re we did release a kids' protein vegan product as well, and it's our first dairy-free line, so kids that have lactose intolerant or other food aversions, um, kids' protein vegan would be perfect for them. So we are free of most allergens. Oh, fantastic. And where can we find this fabulous product if we are interested in Australia? Yeah, so right now we're still working on our Australia manufacturing plant, but we are available on Amazon right now. Um, and then we are also available in China. 
Fantastic. Mackenzie, thank you so much for your valuable insights into Nutritional Growth Solutions and its scientifically formulated product line. And all the best with the times ahead. We do appreciate your time today. Thank you. And if you just joined us out there, we had a very interesting interview with nutritional specialist Mackenzie Hall from Nutritional Growth Solutions. Please watch the full interview at Calgary Media's YouTube channel and keep watching for more of these live expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calgary Media. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Hi there, I'm James for Calcine Media. As the COVID-19 pandemic has turned life on its head, many companies and employees have turned to remote work to maintain productivity and safety. While the shift to remote work was initially seen as a temporary solution, it's increasingly becoming a permanent fixture in the world of work. In fact, a recent survey found that 82% of companies plan to allow their employees to continue working remotely at least some of the time, even after the pandemic well and truly ends. But what does the future of remote work look like? One possibility is that remote work will become the new normal, with more and more companies embracing the idea of a decentralised workforce. This could lead to a proliferation of digital nomads, individuals who are able to work from anywhere in the world with an internet connection. Another possibility is that companies will adopt a hybrid model, where employees are able to work both remotely and in the office. This would allow for the benefits of both worlds, such as the ability to collaborate in person with colleagues and the convenience of working from home. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Regardless of the specific model, it is clear that remote work is here to stay. This shift will have significant implications for the way we work, from the design of our homes to the way we collaborate with colleagues. One of the biggest challenges of remote work is the lack of face-to-face -face interaction. To address this, companies are turning to technology such as virtual reality and augmented reality to create a sense of presence and facilitate remote meetings. These technologies are still in their infancy, but they have the potential to revolutionise the way we work and collaborate. Another challenge of remote work is the blurring of boundaries between work and home life. To address this, it's important for employees to establish clear boundaries and for companies to provide support for maintaining a healthy work-life balance. Now, in any event, the future of remote work is uncertain, but it is clear that it will play a significant role in the way we work. Whether it's through the proliferation of digital nomads, the adoption of a hybrid model, or the use of new technologies, remote work is sure to bring about exciting changes and opportunities in the world of work. All right, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Due to unexpected occurrences that have unfolded throughout the years, the crypto markets have been volatile. Many crypto enterprises have gone bankrupt over the years as a result of massive hacks, scams or mismanagement, resulting in the loss of billions of dollars in investor capital. On that note, let's look at some crypto companies 
that have recently gone bankrupt. FTX, following a Coindesk investigation detailing probable leverage and solvency risks regarding FTX-affiliated trading company Alameda Research. FTX crashed in early November 2022. The collapse of FTX shocked the volatile cryptocurrency market, which lost billions at the time and fell below a $1 trillion valuation. By 11th November 2022, FTX's CEO Sam Bankman Fried resigned and the firm declared bankruptcy. Following that, FTX faced a potential attack in which hundreds of millions of tokens were taken. In late December, FTX founder and ex CEO Sam Bankman Fried was arrested in the Bahamas and extradited to the United States. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. BlockFi, following the catastrophic downfall of FTX. BlockFi filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the United States on the 28th of November 2022. And FTX had actually given the exchange 400 million US dollars earlier in 2022 in a bid to preserve BlockFi with the collapse of FTX. The task got considerably more difficult for BlockFi, which was once valued at 3 billion US dollars. And BlockFi has previously warned that it was considering filing for bankruptcy after deciding to suspend withdrawals on 10th November. The decision to declare bankruptcy was taken to allow BlockFi to stabilize its company and arrange for a full reorganization while working through a list of alternatives. Celsius Network a crypto lending and staking platform declared bankruptcy in June 2022 due to a liquidity issue created by the crypto bear market. The lunar UST disaster exacerbated Celsius's problems and drove the company further into debt. Celsius filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and revealing that of its total liabilities of 5.5 billion US dollars, 4.7 billion US dollars owed to its consumers following a particularly challenging time for cryptocurrencies. The UK-based lending company was forced to shut all operations in June. Three Arrows Capital Three Arrows was the first big crypto company to go bankrupt back in 2022, following the May 2022 collapse of cryptocurrencies Luna and Terra USD. In late June, it declared bankruptcy in the British Virgin Islands. That court appointed liquidators to close down the company and settle its debts. Thanks so much for watching. It's been a tumultuous year for cryptocurrencies. Please do be careful when investing in the space. Keep watching Calkine for more market insights and business news. Sage for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Hi there, I'm James for Calcine Media. If you've been paying attention to the world of finance, you've probably heard of exchange traded funds or ETFs. These popular investment vehicles have been around for decades and allow investors to easily diversify their portfolios by buying a basket of assets in a single transaction. But what about cryptocurrency ETFs? A crypto ETF is essentially the same as a traditional ETF, with one key difference. Instead of being invested in stocks, bonds or other traditional assets, a crypto ETF is invested in cryptocurrencies. This means that when you buy shares in a crypto ETF, you are essentially buying a small piece of a diversified portfolio of various cryptocurrencies. So how does a crypto ETF work? It all starts with the fund manager who is responsible for creating and maintaining the ETF. The fund manager will research and select a basket of cryptocurrencies to include in the ETF and then buy those cryptocurrencies on behalf of the ETF. Right now, Calcine is offering a 7-day free trial on its premium research reports. 
Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The fund manager will also determine the ETF's price and oversee its trading on an exchange. Investors can then buy and sell shares in the ETF just like they would with any other security, using their brokerage account or through a financial advisor. The value of the ETF will rise and fall based on the value of the underlying cryptocurrencies. While crypto ETFs can offer many benefits, it is important to keep in mind that they are not without risk. Like any other investment, the value of a crypto ETF can fluctuate, and it's possible to lose money if the price of the underlying cryptocurrency starts to decline. In addition, the cryptocurrency market is still relatively new and highly volatile, which means that prices can swing wildly in a short period of time. Overall, crypto ETFs offer a convenient and accessible way for investors to gain exposure to the cryptocurrency market, but it is important to carefully consider the risk and do your own research before you invest. Alright, that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Cowguy Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Welcome to Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Michael Chow, founder and executive producer at PS Esports. Established in Hong Kong in 2020, PS Esports is an independent media portal with a focus on everything esports. So here to tell us more about this emerging trend um, and sector is Michael Chow, founder and executive producer at PS Esports. Welcome to the show. Hello, Sage. Thank you for having me on the show. We are glad to have you with us today. It's not every day we get to speak to someone from this emerging sector of esports. So can you help us understand why has there been a rising demand for esports across the globe, practically? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, esports, uh, I guess one of the prominent reasons for the rising demand, uh, as you might have guessed it, uh, would be the pandemic. Uh, as people stay at home, uh, they have to uh, find ways to entertain themselves. Uh, it could be uh, Netflix, it could be YouTube, and uh, video games and esports is, um, I would say, naturally one of the options available to them. So you see uh, game downloads are reaching all-time high, monthly active users numbers are reaching all-time high. And um, uh, even before the uh, COVID, uh, eSports had always been uh, on a rising trend. So um, as game titles become uh, more mature, you get uh, more viewership and uh, more tournaments, the price pool uh, gets bigger and um, the tournaments are held in uh, ever bigger venues. So all the um, sponsors and name brands would like to uh, get a piece of the action. So uh, it's been, uh, you know, um, constantly increasing uh, in terms of revenue and viewership number. And so um, um, the um, uh, industry as a whole is investing more and more. And then, um, the international sporting organizations like uh, the FIA, which governs um, motorsport, and FIFA, which governs football, uh, they would like to reach out to a uh, niche market, um, 
uh, you know, teenagers who are between, uh, let's say, uh, 15 to uh, 22 years old, and uh, they would like to um, reach out to, to them via uh, eSports, which are, you know, not traditionally, uh, uh, I would say, uh, um, consume the uh, content uh, as, as we are, which is, you know, uh, maybe TV and also uh, the um, uh, uh, traditional media. So um, when when the International Olympic Committee and the governments also start to move into the space, you know, uh, the esports is ready uh, to become the mainstream conversation, to be part of it. Thank you. So esports is sort of related to gaming as well, and we've seen gaming really pick up the pace in the last year or so. Um, with blockchain games and AAA games, everyone seems to be gaining. Um, how do you see the technology evolving? Um, there's been many announcements in eSports and you've got an online shop now as well. So we're seeing e-commerce come into it. It's really like a dream come true. You can um, participate in these eSports. Um, but can you help us understand the barriers? Do you think that if you don't have the best technology, you can't get into it? Could you explain the perfect gaming laptop? Uh, well, that's, uh, I would say uh, the um, uh, perception that many people have. You have to have the latest hardware, uh, the latest and greatest uh, uh, computer or, or laptop to be able to participate, which is uh, uh, true in a sense, but not, uh, not all the, uh, always the case. Um, I would say for some of the games, uh, a, a top of the line laptop, uh, like some something from Razer or Asus, uh, ROG, will definitely help you gain an edge uh, if you play games such as uh, first person shooters uh, like Call of Duty, uh, things like that, which is like you know the triple A games which demand a lot of uh, graphics and powers. Uh, so, uh, if money is no object, then uh, get definitely get a top of the line uh, laptop with the latest Intel i7 or i9 processor, um, uh, maybe uh, RTX 3080 graphics card, uh, which is quite important. Uh, if you want to rip uh, all the opponents apart and dominate the game, that is definitely uh, the laptop to have. Or uh, if you want something that is more um, middle of row, uh, something with a Intel i5 processor or Ryzen 7 processor, RTX 37, uh, 3070 graphics card, uh, they'll give you a, a good performance as well. So if you play games like uh, iRacing, uh, Assetto Corsa, you compete um, uh, in uh, Street Fighter, let's say, uh, that is quite uh, you know adequate uh, for, for, the, uh, uh, for those type of gamers. And if you're an occasional gamer and you like to play, uh, you know, maybe uh, a few hours a week, then uh, something more basic, uh, for example, a RTX 3060 graphics card uh, with, a, a, let's say, Intel i5 uh, or below processor, that would uh, get you um, really nicely into the game and, and do your productivity uh, software very well as well. Uh, it will last you for many years to come. Thank you very much for that information. So last year, I think uh, China imposed some curbs on education companies and some um, blockchain gaming companies as well, if I'm not wrong. Now, would you be able to talk us through how esports works? Is it blockchain uh, game and is it like gambling as well? Do you have any insights to share on that and the other important industry news? Uh, yeah, gambling is, is quite a sensitive topic. Uh, locally in Hong Kong, it's not uh, uh, legal to, to be gambling on uh, esports results. Um, but uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, legislation change in China, which uh, limits the uh, number of hours uh, you know, teenagers or children can spend online playing games uh, uh, per day. Uh, it, it affects esports to a certain extent. Uh, you see some of the revenue of the uh, gaming companies uh, um, decrease uh, because of that, and uh, stock prices uh, were affected as well. Um, so, um, I would say 
esports and blockchain games, uh, they are uh, certainly on the rise, and uh, I think it's going to be an upper trend despite, uh, you know, uh, s s sort of uh, the uh, short-term policy changes. So uh, I think in the long term, uh, you know, traditional esports and the new, you know, play-to-earn blockchain games will be uh, will be on the rise and uh, coexist together. Coexist. Sounds great. Um, so there's also that new space of watch to earn. I see some gaming companies post videos up on their sites and you can watch the videos and earn as well. So um, innovation's driving the industry and we'd love to hear your insights about some of the exciting innovations that, ca that have come across your path and what you're planning for your business too. Is fantasy sports similar to esports? Uh, fantasy sports... Uh it could definitely uh, be uh, a genre of esports. Uh, that, that, you know, circles back to the question of what is esports, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, people imagine esports is playing video games and uh, you know spending time in front of a uh, console, but uh, there could be so much more to that. Um, for example, if, uh, Tetris, you know, it, it can be an, an esports. Um, you know, playing uh, something that is, you know, competing against yourself could be an esports as well. You have, uh, for example, the, uh, in the Olympics, cycling with time trial. And uh, if you play a video game and you time the uh, amount of time you finish it, does that count as esports or does it have to be, you, know, you have to play against an opponent? So what, what's, what's the definition? So that, that is something uh, uh, to, to be debated. And um, I think uh, fantasy, Gaming is uh, not at the moment not part of esports. Uh, is something that uh, you know you you have all the other elements of a traditional sports. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, esports, uh, I think uh, at the moment people's perception is something like you know uh, uh, racing, uh, for example, the Formula E Accelerate or the FIA GT Championship, where you know people get together, they sit in front of a, a sim. Uh, sim racing uh, machine and they compete with each other to, to get the best uh, lap time. Or you have uh, five a team, uh, let's say uh, uh, in uh, America you have a uh, team uh, Fnatic and uh, 100 Thieves. Uh, you have uh, five people compete against another team of five people on game titles such as League of Legends and uh, you, you know some other uh, 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 titles as well. So um, I would say uh, th there are certain, you know, games that are coming up, for example, blockchain, which, which could be uh, a good potential for the market to develop. But at the moment, uh, eSports is, as we know it, uh, you know, you have uh, big tournaments, you have big price pool, you have big teams and uh, big marketing. Uh, so it's, it's becoming more like a traditional sports ecosystem, uh, I would say. Well, it's very interesting because if you can help us understand is it actually a virtual version of real sports that are happening, or is it make believe? Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, it's like I said, it's it's uh, very similar to uh, a traditional uh, esports eco uh, traditional sports ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, football, you have the teams, you have the players, and you have the team managers. Uh, you have the, uh, the coaches, the managers. Uh, you have the uh, Australian, uh, you know, football uh, football league, for example, and a lot of advertisers, a lot of in investment to that. Esports is similar, uh, but I would say compared to the traditional sport, where uh, each of the uh, stakeholders they are, uh, I would say, profitable and um, uh, well developed. Uh, you have a um, a system of bringing up young players. Uh, Esports is uh, not quite there yet. Uh, so some of the profits are concentrated on, for example, the, uh, the IP owners, and then uh, the players. Uh, they may have uh, enough uh, of an option when they retire at, let's say, the age of uh, 25 to 30. So there, there are still a few areas that needs to get more mature and uh, more balanced uh, before it's becoming uh, um, uh, 
as mature as the traditional sports. But the revenue is definitely getting there. Yeah. So the money is getting, you know, on par with the traditional sports, I would say. Yeah, the market caps have grown significantly for the industry. So I've noticed that the the fan tokens in the sporting world and the soccer world, they really create a lot of community interaction around them. Uh, people want to get involved with soccer fan tokens. Um, and I'm noticing that there's also some other protocols that involve uh, like run to earn, cycle to earn crypto protocols. And you were mentioning that eSports um, wants to be gamified. And do you see any um, opportunity for teaming up this collaboration with these other protocols? Um, yeah, I, I think in the future it's definitely something that is uh, uh, positive to, uh, to, to the uh, industry. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, the uh, Fnatic, they, they got the uh, 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 citizen key, uh, which I have as well. And uh, they're also selling, you know, uh, more premier keys to their fans. So uh, it's something that is uh, contributing to a, uh, as a revenue stream for the traditional esports teams, right? And um, uh, Hunter Thieves, they give out like a, a necklace, the digital version of it to, to their fans to celebrate their uh, winning of the uh, championship of League of Legends. And then uh, locally, uh, Talon Esports, which is from Hong Kong, they also uh, partner with Polygon to give out uh, NFTs to, uh, to the fans. So uh, it's something that is, uh, I think all the teams are looking at uh, is how they execute uh, that will uh, be uh, the key. And for the play to earn, and uh, you know, run to earn things. Uh, it's it's part of the decentralized uh, landscape. So you get uh, locally uh, the Andy Booker brands, uh, which is quite famous, uh, a unicorn uh, uh, in the metaverse space. Uh, they uh, you know they own Sandbox and uh, and all the other metaverse uh, uh, pieces. So it's uh, I would say they they are not. Uh, Doing that in the eSports fashion, for example, a pay to earn, uh, you, you get uh, blockchain uh, uh, prices uh, when you pay uh, like a sandbox game, right? Uh, but it's not, uh, it doesn't have the competitive element yet. Uh, so I would say in the future, uh, the two may be combined eSports and pay to earn. Uh, you could see, you know, people competing for some price in uh, sandbox. Or, or decentral act, which could be, uh, by definition, a part of esports as well. Uh, but definitely, uh, the protocols, you know, the, uh, the blockchain, the ERC, some don't want things. It's it's going to increase the revenue stream of esports. It opens up another channel for them to uh, communicate with friends and perhaps, uh, you know, uh, get some uh, revenue in the process as well. Yes, that would be so much fun. And you mentioned before NFTs. So for people to uh, participate on your platform, do they need a wallet and to buy NFTs? Oh, uh, not yet. Uh, I mean, uh, our platform is uh, uh, free to access. And uh, NFT is something that we, we are looking, you know, how we can collaborate with uh, the different uh, providers of wallets or exchanges. Uh, we recently partnered with some esports organization. We sponsored uh, the prizes, and we are their media partner. But in terms of creating or maintaining uh, our NFT, uh, that's probably something in, in the medium term. Uh, so uh, I would say don't expect any edge drop from us uh, in, in the near future. But uh, it's something that we're looking at for sure. Fantastic. Well, actually, that's a great segue to our final discussion point. Your objectives for the upcoming months of this year for your company, PS Esports. Yeah, so uh, we are going to focus on uh, content creation, uh, uh, as always. And uh, I think we have uh, plans to expand to, uh, I mean, uh, I'll say, first of all, we'll probably expand our editorial team to create more content, to boost our content creation capability. And then, uh, as you mentioned, we have a, a shop as well. So we are looking to increase the number of products uh, that we stock. Now, at the moment, we have a, a select range, but uh, hopefully they'll expand in the future and uh, you know provide some recommendation to, to 
esports fans as to uh, what equipment to get. And then uh, in the in the medium medium term, who knows? Maybe uh, some NFTs uh, partnering with uh, some exchanges or uh, you know local brands to uh, to to explore uh, that area. Uh, who knows? And then um, uh, esports teams is something that we've always been looking at. It's uh, definitely something that is you know going to get us onto the international stage. Uh, uh, but it. Uh, involves uh, a lot more uh, effort and hopefully uh, we can get some investors on board uh, which should definitely uh, accelerate us towards that goal and uh, in the long term uh, who knows you, you see all the teams doing good things uh, they are uh, you know winning championships they're opening esports uh, stadiums and uh, they are signing up kols uh, who knows the, you know it's you know the the sky is the limit yeah that is a great motto <laughs> Well, it's a very exciting time for your sector, Michael. We do appreciate your insights and your time that you've shared with us today. Thank you very much. Best My of pleasure. luck with your goals. And if you've just joined us, we had an incredible discussion with Michael Chow. He's the founder and executive producer from Hong Kong-based company PS Esports. Please check out the full recording at Kalkine Media's YouTube channel. Keep watching for more of these excellent expert talks and market insights until the next episode. Stay priced and invest wise with Kalkine Media. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. It's been a tough time for the global economy following a two-year period of global lockdowns thanks to the COVID pandemic, coupled with an ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine. The main symptom of the global economic health has been high levels of inflation. It's this factor which has influenced fiscal policy, including the rising of interest rates. But how long will these high levels of inflation last? It's difficult to predict with certainty just how long global inflation will last, as it is influenced by a variety of economic and political factors. One of the main drivers of inflation is the balance between supply and demand in the economy. When demand for goods and services exceeds the available supply, prices can rise. This can be caused by factors such as strong consumer spending, economic growth and increasing the cost of production. Inflation can also be influenced by monetary policy such as the actions of central banks. For example, if a central bank decides to increase the money supply, it can lead to higher prices as more money chases the same amount of goods and services. There are also external factors that can impact inflation, such as natural disasters or geopolitical tensions, which can disrupt supply chains and drive up costs. Overall, the long-term outlook for global inflation will depend on the interplay of these various factors and how they evolve over time. While it's difficult to make precise predictions, most economists expect inflation to remain relatively stable in the long run, as long as there are no major shocks to the economy. Alright, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Automobile manufacturer Renault is considering building a mass-market electric vehicle in India as part of a renewed push 
into a market where EV adoption is expected to grow quickly from a small base. News agency Reuters have been told by two people with knowledge of the ongoing review. The study by Renault underscores how the French automaker is pushing ahead with electrification plans, even as it extends unresolved negotiations with its partner Nissan Motor about investing in an EV unit it plans to carve out from its other operations. It also points to the shifting perception of the auto market in India, which posted the fastest growth of any major market in 2022. EVs are on track to be less than 1% of car sales last year, but the government has set a target of 30% by 2030 and has had recent success in attracting suppliers for international automakers with a range of subsidies. Reuters discover the Renault is looking to launch a made in India electric version of its quid hatchback. The review will assess potential demand, pricing, and the ability to build the EV with local components, said one of the people, adding that any launch would be in late 2024. The move is part of a broader plan by Renault to rekindle sales in a country where the car maker remains profitable, despite selling fewer cars in 2022 than a year earlier. Renault India declined to comment on product plans, but said the company has a strong focus on electrification globally. India is said to become the world's third largest market for passenger and other light vehicles, displacing Japan, according to a forecast by S&P Global Mobility. Industry-wide sales grew an estimated 23% to 4.4 million vehicles in 2022. That's the contrast to the outlook for the United States, where the market's expected to remain below 2019 levels next year, and China, where demand is weakening. So what do you think? You can leave a comment below. You can like and subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon for video notifications. I'm Rachel for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Artificial intelligence, a popular and frequently utilized technology, basically supplies robots with the ability to do a certain activity, minimizing human labor. This is made feasible by implementing specialized programming languages, tools and procedures, or codes into the machine to accomplish jobs with little or no human participation. The scope of artificial intelligence is vast and expanding every day. Scientists began to consider this technology in the early 20th century. Alan Turing is considered amongst the most extraordinary scientists of the 20th century, who created history by laying a strong theoretical foundation of computer science. He was a mathematician, a cryptanalyst, logician, and philosopher. In an article in 1936, he suggested a theoretical device based on the idea that a machine may copy any other machine. John McCarthy created the term artificial intelligence in 1956. He described AI as applying science and engineering to the creation of intelligent machines. It refers to creating a computer system capable of doing tasks that normally require human intellect, such as speech recognition, decision-making, visual perception, and language translation. There are three types of artificial intelligence, artificial narrow intelligence, artificial artificial general intelligence and artificial super intelligence. Now, narrow intelligence or weak AI is when artificial intelligence is applied to a narrow activity. In contrast, artificial general intelligence or strong AI is when a machine can do intellectual work much like a human. Meanwhile, artificial superintelligence refers to the moment a computer's capabilities exceed that of a human being. The Google predictive search engine is a well-known example of AI. 
Meanwhile, a well-known investment banking firm accesses its legal document using its contract intelligence platform. The usage of this AI platform significantly shortened the time required to obtain the legal document. Artificial intelligence is also important in self-driving automobiles. AI has far-reaching implications that are beyond one's comprehension. It can revolutionize global economic productivity and GDP potential. Significant investment in numerous AI technologies is required to make this achievable. Now, according to a PwC study that was published in 2017, product innovations would account for 45% of overall economic benefits by 2030. AI would contribute over $15.7 trillion to the global economy, and it would boost the economy by 26% in GDP. So what do you think about the importance of AI? You can leave a comment below and don't forget to like and subscribe and you can press the bell icon for more videos. I'm Rachel for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space, and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The outbreak of the COVID-19 epidemic weighed on the Chinese economy. Three years of a zero COVID policy sparked huge protests and China's stringent lockdown policy hampered the economy and drove retail sales and industrial output to their lowest since the pandemic's outbreak in early 2020. According to the National Bureau of Statistics of China, the country's industrial output growth, which includes activity in the manufacturing, mining and utility sectors, decreased to a negative 2.9% in April 2022 from 5% in March 2022. The COVID-19 curb significantly impacted China's consumer spending, with retail sales plunging 11.1% year-on-year in April 2022. With millions of citizens restricted to their homes due to the lockdown, consumption dropped significantly. Meanwhile, the Chinese labor market suffered as well, with the unemployment rate rising to 6.1% in April 2022 from 5.8% in March that year, the highest level since February 2020. In April 2022, the unemployment rate among young individuals aged 16 to 24 hit an alarming 18.2%. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. In November 2022, the surveyed unemployment rate in urban areas of China ranged at 5.7%, up from 5.5% in the previous month. China's stock market index, the Shanghai Composite, which is widely considered the benchmark for the performance of the Chinese stock market, plunged 13.12% between January 2022 and January 2023. World Bank had earlier said that economic growth in China was projected to slow to 4.3% in 2022 before rebounding to a 5.2% in 2023, largely reflecting the economic damage caused by the persistence of COVID-19. Meanwhile, the Chinese government has strongly opposed COVID-19 pandemic testing requirements placed on Chinese travelers and warned of retaliation against countries that impose them, including the United States and many European nations. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and subscribe to our channel. You can also leave a comment and press the bell icon to get more videos from us. I'm Rachel for Calkine Media. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. 
Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Welcome to Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage, and today's guest is Michael Pearl. He is a COO at Ecorobo. The derivative market can be volatile. Are you interested in crypto but hesitant to invest due to issues relating to safety and user experience? Well, Corobo is a community-driven platform which is easy to use and closes the gap between the potential of this amazing emerging technology, cryptocurrency and blockchain, and its accessibility to new users. So we have Michael Pearl, COO of Corobo, with us today to tell us more about the Corobo platform. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hi, thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you for joining us. We're glad that you're here to share some insights with us. Can we start off with finding out more about your platform, Kirobo? What was the inspiration behind your innovative brand? Kirobo, uh, as you mentioned, uh, crypto and the DeFi space in specific, the decentralized finance space, can be very dangerous. And uh, a lot of people that want to get involved uh, are fearful because all, the, all of the perils that uh, arise from interacting with this uh, innovative uh, uh, financial sphere. Uh, issues like losing your funds due to sending it to the wrong address, issues like uh, uh, losing your wallet, something that we hear a lot in the news, issues like, you know, unfortunately someone passing away and not being able to leave his or her crypto behind to their loved ones. Those are the issues that are on the minds on, of people that uh, would like to engage with this uh, innovative uh, crypto sphere. And that's the things that we're tackling. Uh, Kirobo is creating a safe and secure infrastructure for crypto. Uh, we identified the main uh, pain points and uh, we're addressing them one by one and quite successfully, if I may say. That sounds great. Thanks, Michael, especially when it's becoming more um, heavily adopted by people out there. Those are um, definitely uh, issues that need solutions. So could we find out more about how Kiro token holders power the ecosystem of services at Kirobo? Kirobo, um, from the, from the get-go, basically, uh, has defined itself as a decentralized platform. Uh, this means that we don't want to control the system like uh, you can see in the Web2, uh, let's say Facebook, Google, uh, and the, the different tech companies that are working in the Web2 space. Uh, in the crypto space, we strive to be uh, fully decentralized. And that means that um, the activators of the system, the people who actually uh, are running the engine, so to speak, and, and the fuel that runs the engines, uh, they should be uh, uh, members of the community and it should be as decentralized as possible, meaning we should have as many players as possible engaged and activating the system. Uh, that is why we created a whole token economy, uh, which is a big word for creating basically a mechanism that would make it um, um, worthwhile for the community to activate the system. So we have a system of um, uh, users that are using our features, for instance, backing up their wallets, and they're paying a certain fee that will be basically deposited and will wait for another community member that will activate this backup. And that's how you have a full cycle of community members enjoying the, um, the features that uh, we have to offer, and other community members incentivized and gaining um, uh, by uh, basically activating the system and helping their friends. That sounds great. Thank you, Michael. So API payments and open source banking are becoming buzzwords and definitely much more popular. What are the similarities to Karobo's DeFi ecosystem and this new digital banking that's occurring in the centralized financial space? I think that uh, there are two main, um, uh, two main terms uh, that the API banking is bringing to the table. One is ease of use. Obviously, everything becomes much easier, much more streamlined, much faster. Uh, you don't have to go through any uh, physical bank. And uh, even the services that the uh, traditional banks were offering uh, on the digital space were, not, uh, were definitely not seamless. 
And now with the, all those neo banks, uh, we have better access to our funds. We can do more with them. And the second term would be uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, everything is interconnected. Uh, all the different platforms that you have can uh, talk to each other and basically can benefit the user. And I think that this is one of the things that we see now in the DeFi, the decentralized finance space, where Web3, this big term, that basically means that um, we have a decentralized system of wallets that serve as your identity. And with this identity, you can do many, many different things that you could not have done in the crypto space, which brings the crypto space much, much closer to the traditional finance, basically. And now you can interact with your crypto assets, your digital assets, your NFTs, uh, quite close to, uh, to how you could do this in the traditional finance. And as you said, it's part of the bigger picture, which is mass adoption. Great. Now, on-ramping sometimes can be tricky with DeFi platforms. Can we talk about how the Liquid Vault function works and how is it different from any other wallet? The Liquid Vault is a wallet, but it's a wallet 2.0. It's a meta wallet, if you wish. Um, uh, in, in a sense that it, it has all the functionalities of a regular wallet in terms of storing your crypto and allowing you to send and receive crypto. But then basically the re usual wallet stops. Uh, what the Liquid Vault offers is a bevy of other features that are basically non-existent in other wallets. Just to give you an example, I mentioned the backup feature. Uh, when you have a regular wallet, what happens if you lose your private keys? Uh, again, we keep hearing about all those tra tragic uh, cases of people losing everything in a heartbeat because they forgot one word in their seed phrase or because they lost their physical wallet and so on. There are so many stories because we are prone to human error and we lose things all, all the time. And uh, the crypto space is, is not different than that. Uh, we intend to offer much, much more in the future, things like uh, limit orders, for instance. Right now, uh, in the decentralized finance, if you want to trade, you need to physically be there. There are some, um, uh, uh, some services that uh, are trying to, to help with that, but it's nowhere near the limit orders that we know from the traditional finance and even from the centralized crypto finance. And what we want to do is want to, we want to bring those abilities to the decentralized finance. So for instance, if there's a market crash, you will be saved from that because you have put a limit order in place and you know that um, you got out of this uh, problematic uh, asset and, and you pre-plan for it and basically you're safe. And by the same token, you can gain from, from uh, um, you know, market rallies and you can enjoy everything that automatic trading has to offer, but you could not have reached uh, uh, thus far uh, in the DeFi space. Well, that backup feature sounds amazing. It sounds a lot better than giving your private key to a lawyer, for example, to look after for you. Um, and do you offer dem demos of, of your wallets and things like that? Um, I don't think that uh, a demo is needed. People can just um, uh, go ahead and, and, and go to kirobo.io. Uh, they can open a liquid vault. It's free, uh, uh, except for the gas fees that they have to pay to the gods of crypto. Uh, the, the, the use is free. Uh, they can just go and log in and try the system and, and, and play with it. They can join our communities where they can uh, uh, receive a lot of information and they can receive a lot of support from the community for, uh, you know, the uh, there's a lot of know-how on, on how to conduct their business in the crypto space in general and uh, with respect to the Liquid Vault in specific. Uh, so it's very straightforward. They can go on Discord, on Telegram. They can see our tutorials on YouTube. Uh, so it's very easy and no demos are needed. And again, you can watch the video so you can see uh, basically some tutorials on how to do it. Yeah, tutorials are great. Thanks for that, Michael. Um, and we just head to your website, kirobo.io, for that. Is that correct? Fantastic. Yes. So, dApps, to finish up this conversation, which has been so informative, dApps allow for innovations. Can you tell us more about the Liquid Vault and the dApp Connect, please? The Liquid Vault, uh, probably I should take a step back to explain why we call it the Liquid Vault. Uh, vault is associated with security and rightfully so because the liquid vault 
is uh, probably one of the most secure, and we may argue, we may even argue the most secure solution for storing your crypto. Uh, but it's not a vault in the sense that it's not locked in your basement and you cannot access it. It's liquid, meaning that your funds are liquid. You can do whatever you want with them. There are so many things that people do in the DeFi space, things like staking, uh, like offering liquidity, uh, like um, uh, participating in insurance protocols and many, many other things basically that are uh, uh, yield, uh, that, that bring them yields uh, on, their, on their crypto and uh, that, that are beneficial for them. And people can still do all this while their crypto is stored in the liquid vault. So in a sense, it's not a safe that you just lock up. It's a safe that is uh, transparent and you can always access and you can grow your crypto because that's the name of the game now in the DeFi space, mm -hmm. but still do it in a safe and secure manner. That sounds amazing because sometimes getting your crypto out of liquidity pools requires various wallets. Um, I understand there's a Terra Station wallet that's sometimes required when you're trading with Terra. So it sounds like the Liquid Vault could offer solutions there for having multiple wallets. Am I understanding correctly? Is it interoperable? The Liquid Vault, the, the liquid vault essentially uh, should serve as your uh, main wallet. Uh, uh, basically, to open the Liquid Vault, you are using your wallet uh, to, to deploy the Liquid Vault, but then your wallet, let's say your MetaMask, your Ledger, your Trezor, it just becomes your login to this entire world of the Liquid Vault. And uh, you, don't, you don't need to use your original wallet anymore. Basically, all your funds, including NFTs, by the way, can be stored in the Liquid Vault, and the Liquid Vault can serve as your uh, prime wallet uh, and definitely as your own personal custodian. Uh, I, I don't know if I said this before, but the Liquid Vault is non-custodial. The blockchain is the custodian, and you have a unique copy of the Liquid Vault, so you are the only beneficiary, you are the only one who has the access to your funds, and basically uh, that's the only wallet that you will need in the future. And as we bring in more and more features, uh, people will understand that uh, this is a one-stop shop for crypto and for DeFi. And uh, when we go to other networks as well, then I'm sure that uh, people will uh, want to keep most of their assets in the Liquid Vault and they will gain from it. Thank you, Michael. Yes, I'm, I'm understanding more clearly now. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Your products sound fantastic. I'm definitely going to check them out and your tutorials on your website. Thanks for being available for us today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And if you just joined us, we had a very informative discussion with Michael Pearl, the CEO from Kirobo, about their fantastic DeFi wallet, the Liquid Vault wallet. So please check it out at their website, kirobo.io. And for the full interview, head to Kalkine Media's YouTube channel and keep watching for more of these live expert talks and market insights. Stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine Media. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's Daily Crypto Catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Hey there, I'm James for Kalkine Media, and in this video, we'll be taking a look at one of China's greatest entrepreneurs, Jack Ma. Jack Ma is a Chinese business magnate and philanthropist who is the co-founder and former executive chairman of Alibaba Group, a multinational technology company. Born Ma Yun, he is known for being one of China's richest men and one of the world's most successful entrepreneurs. Ma was born on October 15, 1964 in Hangzhou, China. He grew up in a poor family and struggled academically 
failing his college entrance exams twice before finally being accepted to Hangzhou Teachers College. After graduating, he worked as an English teacher for several years before starting his own business. In 1999, Ma co-founded Alibaba Group, which has since become one of the world's largest online and mobile commerce companies. The company operates through a variety of platforms, including the Alibaba.com wholesale platform, the Taobao online shopping platform, and the Tmall retail platform. In 2014, Alibaba's initial public offering on the New York Stock Exchange was the largest in history at the time, raising more than $25 billion. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. As of 2023, Jack Ma has acquired $34 billion in personal wealth, making him the fifth richest person in China. Ma is known for his unconventional leadership style and his commitment to innovation. He's been praised for his vision in building Alibaba into a global company and for his efforts to promote entrepreneurship in China. In addition to his business pursuits, Ma is also a philanthropist and has supported a number of charitable causes, including education, the environment, and healthcare. In 2014, he founded the Jack Ma Foundation, which focuses on improving education and the environment in China. Ma announced his retirement from Alibaba in 2019 and handed over the reins to CEO Daniel Zhang. Despite his retirement, Ma remains an influential figure in the business world and is considered one of the most successful entrepreneurs of his generation. Alright, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. There is no sign of a cost-of-living crunch at Rolls-Royce, the luxury carmaker powered to a new sales record in 2022. It sold just over 6,000 cars during the period. That was almost 9% up on 2021, itself a record year. The sales boom comes despite an average price tag for its vehicles of about $534,000. It also comes despite Rolls stopping all sales in Russia, normally the market for a few hundred cars each year. Health crisis-related lockdowns drove a drop in China too. But the company says its sales stayed strong in the Americas, with the US accounting for just over a third. Now Chief Executive Torsten Müller-Ertwurst says order books are full way into 2023. And they could be set for another big boost. The firm's first electric vehicle will go on sale at the end of the year. Rolls-Royce says pre-orders for the Spectre have far exceeded all expectations. It hasn't revealed a price for the vehicle, but says that is never a big issue for its customers. The company has said it expects to have fully switched to electric power for its cars by the end of the decade. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. The BMW Group looks to be staying ahead of its arch-rival, 
that's despite a drop in sales over the year. In 2022, they fell almost 5%, with Europe and China hard hit by supply chain troubles. Deliveries in the US were more stable, though, and sales of electric vehicles more than doubled. Sales at its ultra-luxury Rolls-Royce brand also hit a record. All that was just enough to keep BMW in the lead over Mercedes. It sold just over 2 million vehicles during 2022. That was slightly down on a year before, though orders picked up strongly in the fourth quarter. Sales of its high-end Maybach vehicles surged by more than a third. Entry-level vehicles were hit hard, however, as they were the worst affected by supply chain bottlenecks. Tuesday also saw a cautious outlook from Volkswagen. It says 2023 looks volatile, though worries over part supplies are easing. VW says SUVs remain the fastest growing segment, accounting for 80% of all sales in the US. That includes the Bentayga models made by luxury unit Bentley, which also posted record sales. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Natural disasters turned last year into one of the costliest on record. That's according to a key survey from reinsurer Munich Re on Tuesday. It found losses from natural catastrophes covered by insurance came to $120 billion, just short of 2017's record. It's even higher when they include uninsured damages, dragging the total up to $270 billion last year. Munich Re said annual losses over $100 billion appeared to be the new normal. It mostly blamed Hurricane Ian in the US and floods in Australia for last year's big numbers. Hurricane Ian hit Florida in September and caused $60 billion of insured damages. Floods in Australia early in the year and again in October caused $4.7 billion of insured compensation. Pakistan also endured $15 billion in damages, most of it uninsured. The country was hit by major floods due to record monsoon rains and faster melting glaciers which killed at least 1,700 people. Scientists said the events in 2022 were made worse by climate change. They also warned there would be more to come as Earth's atmosphere warms through the next decade and beyond. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Kalkine Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today, I'm speaking with Glenn Cross. Glenn is the chairman at EZZ Life, a genomic life science company with a mission to improve the quality of life and human health. Hello, Glenn. It's great to have you with us today. Good afternoon, Rachel. Good to be here. I'm very interested to hear more about the company. So could you just tell us a little more about EZZ Life and what you do? Sure. Um, we're an ASX listed company, Rachel. We listed um, 18 months ago. We are a manufacturer and distributor of um, beauty care products as well as uh, a range of um, health supplements, probiotics, um, and nutraceuticals. We distribute uh, the products, we manufacture the products primarily in Australia uh, and we distribute the products through Australia, New Zealand, uh, China and a number of countries in Southeast Asia. 
Excellent. Now, um, I believe in the first half of financial year 2022, EZZ Life Sciences earned a revenue of $6.2 million. Now, how did you achieve these results? Well, firstly, um, the results uh, were down on our previous six months, prim primarily due to the um, COVID pandemic. So we were very pleased in the end to get uh, the revenue of um, just over $6 million. The revenue was, um, again, primarily Australia and New Zealand, but um, a growing revenue base in China um, and um, some of the, our newer markets in Southeast Asia. And we distribute the products through uh, existing retail network, which is um, a pharmacy, a specialist uh, supermarkets, online uh, and in China through um, Alibaba's Tmall. Great. Now, in your view, Galen, what makes EZZ Life Sciences distinctive from its market peers? Well, we think we're distinctive because um, all of our products are um, of um, scientifically developed, of high quality. Our products are all registered with the TGA here in Australia. So they have looked at the components in our products as well as the good manufacturing practice um, in the manufacturing plants that uh, make our products. So we have high quality products that are designed specifically for, um, well, in general well-being. But more than that, we um, are morphing into a genomics company where we are working on specialised um, a specialised product range for specific uh, disease states. The first two um, that we've uh, introduced products for are Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacteria that causes severe gut problems, and also HPV, which is the human papillomavirus. So we will um, we will continue to uh, increase that our product range by looking at um, using genomics and personalised um, medicine and personalised uh, nutritional products to, uh, to, to work on specific disease states. So that makes us a bit different than someone just providing um, you know, a vitamin range or some products for more general wellbeing, if you like. Yeah, very interesting space to be working in. Now, the company started operations back in 2018 and, as you mentioned, was listed on the ASX in 2021. How has the journey on the market for EZZ Life Sciences been so far, especially during the COVID period? Yeah, well, what an interesting time to, uh, to list. <laughs> so the first, um, our first, eight, uh, our first um, nine to 10 months in our first full year uh, listed, we actually had um, an excellent year. And we actually paid a maiden dividend to our shareholders, which is rare for any company and uh, quite rare for a, um, a life science company. So we had a very good start to our journey with the ASX. As I mentioned, our 21-22 uh, first half results were down on the previous year, but we were severely impacted with the um, continuing lockdowns in especially Sydney, Melbourne uh, and New Zealand. But, but in general, we've been very pleased with, with the journey. Um, we appreciate all of our shareholders um, and, and we, we were very happy to reward them with that maiden dividend in our first year. That certainly is great news. And what can you tell me about the criteria for research and development at EZZ Life Sciences? We have, um, we have relationships with uh, a number of uh, universities. Um, so the, the R&D um, comes from, um, from well-qualified research personnel inside of um, highly credited research uh, institutes. We, we basically are looking for specific um, disease states uh, where we believe that we can provide products that will um, that will aid people in the in the treatment uh, and their ongoing health uh, in those areas. But in more general sense, we're focused on uh, weight management um, and longevity, just general well-being. Uh, as we move through the next uh, one to two years, we have another uh, two or three areas that we are going to focus on. 
and we'll work with our research partners to develop products, manufacture them locally under good manufacturing practice, register them with the TGA and provide high quality products um, to our customer base that are, are developed specifically for them. And you're also investing for future growth through your ongoing technical capacity development and in-house e-commerce capability expansion. Could you please elaborate for us on your expansion plans? Well, there's two areas, um, Rachel. One is on the manufacturing side. We are actively uh, seeking to purchase a, a GMP facility, either in Australia or New Zealand, so that we can uh, backward integrate our business and uh, take over control of uh, more control over the raw materials and the manufacturing themselves. And in terms of our um, uh, e-commerce, we're developing uh, a lot more capability around our own website, uh, as well as working with um, specific e-commerce partners, both um, locally and internationally. Um, one of them is, of course, Alibaba, but we are um, actively uh, looking at increasing our uh, e-commerce uh, business across across Asia and China. Well, it's been fabulous to chat with you today, Glenn. Thank you so much for giving your insights there. Thanks, Rachel. Pleasure. And best of luck for the future. It sounds like very exciting times for your company. Now, that was Glenn Cross, chairman at EZZ Live. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Kalkine Media. So make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space, and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's Daily Crypto Catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Prince Harry's Spare became the UK's fastest selling non-fiction book ever. Its publisher said on Tuesday, after days of TV interviews, leaks, and a mistaken early release of the memoir containing intimate revelations about the British royal family. Harry's book has garnered attention around the world with its disclosure about his personal struggles and its accusations about other royals, including his father King Charles, stepmother Camilla, and elder brother Prince William, citing British sales figures, the publisher said it had sold 400,000 copies so far across hardback, ebook, and audio formats. Earlier in the day, Caroline Lennon, a retail worker and one of the eager readers who had headed to bookshops to get their copy on the first day of its release, said she would read the book immediately as she posed for photographers. I like him. I like him. I like the Royal Family. I was here when Diana bought her book out and um, I just, I queued up then. And uh, now I'm queuing up again and I'm enjoying myself. The, at the moment, I think the man needs to get himself sorted out because it looks to me like he's carrying the weight of his, the childhood, the death of Diana. He's, he's carrying it all. With that family, there's no love and no passion. It, he want that, he wants that back in his life. That's where Diana gave him that love. He wants a lot of affection and love. Are you a bit surprised it's just you here today, Caroline? Yeah. You know what, can I just say, I know how Diana feels now. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm looking forward to listening to the audio. Great. Great. Are you going to read it today? Yeah. Despite the lack of cues, Waterstone said there had been strong pre-orders for the memoir, which currently ranks 
as the best seller on Amazon's UK, US, Australian, German, and Canadian websites. The royal family has not commented on the book or the interviews and is unlikely to do so. It really is such a, a groundbreaking, groundbreaking uh, book and unprecedented within the royal family. You know, we've seen other books come out in the past. You know, his mother's book, of course, his famous book, her famous book with Andrew Morton, and then Charles also cooperating with the book in the 90s, but nothing quite like this. I mean, the scale of this and the intimate details he shares about, about life within the royal family, there, we haven't seen anything like this before. Extracts from the book were leaked last Thursday when its Spanish language edition also went on sale by mistake in some bookshops in Spain. Harry speaks of his grief and growing up after the death of his mother, Princess Diana, when he was just 12. His use of cocaine and other drugs to cope, how he killed 25 Taliban fighters while serving as a soldier in Afghanistan, and even how he lost his virginity. He also reveals a heated row with William, the heir to the throne, saying his brother knocked him over and how they had both begged his father not to marry Camilla, who he wed in 2005 and is now the Queen Consort. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Ukrainian servicemen fired anti-aircraft guns at Russian positions on Tuesday near Bakhmut. The city is located on a strategic supply line between the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, which make up the Donbas, Ukraine's industrial heartland. Gaining control of Bakhmut could give Russia a platform to advance on two bigger cities, Kramatorsk and Slovyansk. It would also be a welcome battlefield victory for President Vladimir Putin after a series of setbacks in recent months. Kiev said on Tuesday that its troops are facing waves of assaults by Russian forces on a small salt mining town of Solodar. And seizing Solodar would give an advantage to Russian forces as they hope to capture Bakhmut, only a few miles to the southwest. Sergei Chirivati, a spokesperson for Ukraine's Eastern Forces, said the Russians were deploying their best Wagner fighters at Solodar, which had been struck 86 times by artillery over the past 24 hours. Britain's defense ministry said Russian troops and Wagner fighters were probably now in control of most of the town after advances in the last four days. But in his nightly video address on Monday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Bakhmut and Solida were holding on despite widespread destruction. Reuters could not verify the battlefield reports. Meanwhile, two British voluntary workers have gone missing after they left the city of Kramatorsk for Solidar on Friday morning, according to Ukrainian police. Authorities said on Monday they were now looking for them. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg on Tuesday said Russia was mobilizing more troops for the war in Ukraine and should not be underestimated. And there is no indication that President Putin has changed uh, the overall aim of his uh, uh, brutal war against uh, Ukraine. So we need to be prepared for the long haul. That as Russia's defense ministry released footage of a warship armed with hypersonic cruise weapons holding exercises in the Norwegian Sea. Last week, Putin sent the frigate to the Atlantic Ocean armed with new generation missiles in a signal to the West that Russia will not back down over what it calls its special military operation.
If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Hi there, I'm James Preston for Kalkine Media. Bitcoin might have dipped in value over the last 12 months, but the decentralized digital currency has gained traction as an alternative for goods and services since its inception in 2009, potentially having a significant impact on the economy. One major advantage of using Bitcoin is that it allows for fast, secure and inexpensive transactions without the need for intermediaries like banks. This can potentially lead to lower transaction costs, particularly for cross-border payments. Additionally, the decentralized nature of Bitcoin means that it's not subject to the same regulations and limitations as traditional currencies, giving it a level of flexibility that can be attractive to businesses. The adoption of Bitcoin by businesses can also lead to greater financial inclusion, particularly in developing countries where access to traditional banking services is limited. Bitcoin allows individuals to easily send and receive money without the need for a bank. Potentially oats below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Kalkine. Hello, I'm Rachel and welcome to today's Crypto Catch from Kalkine TV, all the latest from the world of crypto. Firstly, a look at bankrupt crypto company Celsius, a court-ordered examiner is expected to release a report addressing whether they operated as a Ponzi scheme, which could add to the pressure on founder Alex Mashinsky, who is already facing fraud allegations. U.S. bankruptcy judge Martin Glenn, who's overseeing the crypto lender platform's Chapter 11 case, appointed former prosecutor Shoba Pillay as an independent examiner in September, tasking her with investigating Celsius customers' allegations that the company operated as a Ponzi scheme and reporting on the company's handling of cryptocurrency deposits. New Jersey-based Celsius filed for Chapter 11 protection from creditors last July in Manhattan after freezing customer withdrawals from its platform. It listed a $1.19 billion deficit on its balance sheet. Moving on, a U.S. judge yesterday said the names of two people who helped guarantee bail for indicted FTX cryptocurrency exchange founder Sam Bankman fried should be made public, but put his ruling on hold pending an expected appeal. The judge said that while the public had only a weak right to know who Bankman frieds guarantors were, it outweighed Bankman frieds arguments for confidentiality, including that the guarantor's safety could be imperiled. A spokesman for Bankman fried declined to comment. The 30-year-old has been confined to his parents' home in California after pleading not guilty to fraud for allegedly looting billions of FTX customer dollars. 
Well, let's take a look at the markets now. And the largest cryptocurrency by market value, Bitcoin, was recently trading at around 22,889 US dollars. That's up 0.28% over the last hour, but sitting below its high on Sunday when it was up to near $24,000. Ethereum is up 0.45% on the last hour and stands at 1,573 US dollars. Well, that's the latest on Kalkine's Daily Crypto Catch. I'm Rachel, signing off for now. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic. And Kalkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi's and NFT's? Well, do your homework, gain a scan radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. Watch Calcine Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators and with the use cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world with me, Sage, from Calci Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcon Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcon Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. British consumers turned a little bit less pessimistic in December as inflation started to fall back from historic highs, a new survey shows. Polling firm YouGov and consultancy CEBR said their overall consumer confidence index rose by one point from November, although at 95.9 it remained stuck in negative territory. In December 2021, it stood at 110. The CEBR says while they expect inflation to continue to subside throughout 2023, consumers will still feel the pinch from the higher food prices and those exposed to higher mortgage rates will see their monthly costs go up significantly. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The survey showed consumers were worried about the loss of value of their homes, but they were more confident about the outlook for their finances. Britain's inflation rate hit a 41-year high of 11.1% in October, but eased off to 10.7% in November. The Bank of England thinks it will slow to around 5% by late 2023. YouGov says its survey was based on 6,000 interviews over the month of December. A separate survey of consumer confidence conducted by polling firm GFK last month also showed a slight increase in optimism in December, but figures published earlier this week showed consumer spending lagged inflation. Now, what do you think? You can leave a comment below. And if you like this video, you can like it, you can share it, and you can subscribe to our channel. You can also press the bell icon to get more videos from us. I'm Rachel for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Right now, Calcine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now.
Hello, I'm James Preston for Kaokai Media and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this edition, I'll be shining a light on Black Canyon resources and the best way to do that is to sit down with the Executive Director at the company, Brendan Cummins. And Brendan, thank you so much for joining me here today. Yeah, good day, James. Uh, good to catch up with you again and, and give a give a bit of an update to the you know the company's progress over the last uh, last twelve months. Yeah, absolutely. And first and foremost, Brendan, for those who aren't familiar with Black Canyon Resources, what exactly does your company focus on? Oh, look, we're um, we were listed as a as a um, IPO in May twenty twenty one, and since then, you know, we're an explorer, primarily focused on manganese. Uh, we're not looking for any other commodities, it's just manganese. And we've been really fortunate that we made a significant discovery uh, last year. And, and that's been the basis of um, the work, you know, a lot of the work we did uh, through 2022. And um, yeah, so there's a lot to be, a lot, to, a lot going on. Uh, certainly a lot more happening in 2023 as well. Yeah, we'll get to that discovery in just a moment. But first and foremost, take me through the, uh, the joint venture with Caroline. Now, how significant is that? Oh, look, it's it, like like a lot of uh, earning joint ventures when that when that struck. You know, the, the original deal was uh, Black Canyon. We spent four million dollars over a five year period to earn seventy five percent in the projects. The projects being exploration tenements, uh, which cover about eight hundred square kilometres of the eastern Pilbara, so a very large chunk of ground. Um, so we've actually spent four million dollars now, but we've done it in about eighteen months. And so that probably reflects the um, significance of the discovery um, at Flanagan Ball um, and, and the work programs that are associated with uh, moving that one through from you know, resource delineation through to project development. So um, we're really entering a feasibility stage now. So our expenditure is only going to go up from here. So, but what it means is, you know, it's secured us 75% of the projects now, um, Flanagan Ball, uh, and then ultimately end of the day, you know, we build a mine there, we have 75% of the revenues that come out of that as well. So, uh, and we've got a really excellent joint venture partner, Caroline Resources, uh, that they, uh, that they really good and, and that they are going to contribute that 25% going forward. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a really strong arrangement uh, between the two companies. Now it does sound like a very good match, but let's focus specifically on Flanagan Ball. And obviously 2022 was a massive year for that project. Could you take us through the mineral resource estimate, the scoping and any of the other major developments from Flanagan Ball? Yeah, so I was sort of trying to cast my mind back uh, to 2022. And, um, you know, it all started actually in the December 2021 when we did quite a large drill program. And at that point, I think, um, I mean, I was on the rig as well. So I, was, I, was, I saw the drill trips and I was got pretty excited. excited. I figured we were onto something you know, fairly early. So um, through the course of the first quarter, uh, we started to get, get those results back and uh, we announced a discovery of Flanagan Ball probably in about February, um, which was the FB3 deposit, never been drilled before. And then as we worked through and waited for the exploration results to come through, all the assays results and put the geology together, um, you know, we announced 104 million tonnes at 10.5%. Uh, which by all accounts is a pretty decent uh, first crack at it. Uh, you know, it's you know, going from zero to, to that amount of resource in, in one drill program is, has been an outstanding result for the company. And then sort of moving on from there, we, um, we did that scoping study. So that was also, um, so I guess, you know, investors need to understand a scoping study is a low level technical and economic assessment of the deposit. It has accuracy limits of about 35%, so plus or minus 35%. So it's really the initial stage um, when you start to assess a, a project as, as to whether it could be viable. And we were really pleasantly surprised by the uh, outcome of, of that scoping study as well. So um, I could probably touch on that in a bit more detail later, but you know, once we, we realise that we do have something that could be worth a lot of money and a lot of value in the ground, uh, we embarked on a second round of drilling. That was in May and June. Got the res those results back and, uh, and then upgraded that mineral resource um, from 104 million tonnes to 171 million tonnes at 10.3% wow. uh, manganese. So uh, another big step up, and it certainly puts us amongst the, the size and, and, and probably uh, in terms of grade range, probably a little bit above some of our competitors as well. So that was uh, you know an, another big milestone for the company in 2023, uh, 2022, sorry, and, uh, excuse me. And then we've uh, jumped straight into metallurgical test work on, on those materials as well, looking at how we can uh, re recover the manganese out of out of that material, um, out of the ore. I should add that the mineral resources now are um, uh, majority of measured resources. So in terms of, you know, jaw classification, measured is the highest quality resource, the most confidence. 
and, and that really reflects the deposit. We've drilled it on a 100 by 100 litre space drill pattern, which is quite broad, but what we are seeing is really good continuity uh, geologically and also uh, in terms of grade distribution across the deposits. They're big, you know, kilometre by kilometre type deposits, so very large deposits. Um, and that but really bodes well for mining and processing in the future because a very consistent homogenous deposit is predictable. And then when you uh, set up your processing plan, putting in a predictable feed, you know, potentially means a predictable um, concentrate at the back end. So that'll be uh, what we're working on. Um, you know, is one of the things in 2023. Um, and then also manganese sulfate. Uh, you know, the battery boom's not going away. Uh, every day you're reading more and more about how this is growing and people's interest in owning electric vehicles. The market is, is growing you know, significantly. So uh, with the concentrates that we can generate from Flanagan Bore and from other manganese oxide deposits, uh, probably across our portfolio, um, to be able to produce manganese sulfate that can feed into, it, into, a, into the battery, um, battery gigafactory world um, would also be a, a really, you know, it, it's, it's one of the uh, outcomes we're hoping for 2023 as well. I understand you recently did some test work at Flanagan Ball with the discovery that there was the potential to produce a high purity manganese compound. Now, how significant is that? And overall for the company, I mean, is that a massive development for you guys? Or is that sort, sort of more par for the course, if you will? Oh, look, we see it as a, as a complementary uh, process. Uh, so, you know, at Flanagan Bore, for example, we're looking at a, a long life mine, 20 year mine life. Um, we need to get that into production and we need to run, run through the approvals for that. That's a couple of years out. So the primary, the primary product that gets produced from Flanagan Bore will be a manganese concentrate. Now, most of that's gonna feed into the steel industry. Um, that's where most manganese concentrate goes to, but we're also looking at uh, carving out a portion, proportion of that and producing manganese sulfate. So the significance of that is um, recently some of our peers have, have announced um, deals with car manufacturers and battery manufacturers. So I think slowly the penny's starting to drop that um, everyone's after lithium, no question about that. Um, the second, you know, second cap off the rank has been nickel and cobalt. Uh, manufacturers looking to secure uh, safe supplies of that. But uh, manganese is starting to get on the radar now. So it's really playing well to, to our overall strategy of of being a supplier to the steel industry, but also being able to develop a flow sheet that can produce manganese sulfate from across our tenement portfolio. So that's really, um, you know, one aspect of the company that I think uh, is, is set to probably blossom as well over, over the next 12 months um, as, as we just further develop, develop the projects. We've talked about lithium there as being the key one and then nickel and cobalt, but obviously manganese is, is right up there as well. How big is the potential market for manganese and is it likely to grow or shrink into the future? Oh, look, the chemistries for batteries is, is evolving and there's two aspects of it. So within China, um, most of these battery minerals are um, sourced, uh, sourced globally, but they end up in China. They're, they're manufactured or uh, processed into battery products and then they, they make the batteries, they make the cars. So that sort of makes a bit of sense. A lot of it happens in China, but you've got uh, Europe and the US sort of needing to catch up now. So they want to make their own materials and secure their own supply chains internally, rather than uh, having to rely on um, other countries to supply that to them. So that's probably one factor that plays well for Australia. You know, we do have all these commodities right here in, in Australia, a lot of them in WA, which is, uh, very fortunate so we can see a battery industry uh, certainly uh, burgeoning here in WA so the US uh, with that inflation reduction act as well also um, they're looking to encourage uh, battery manufacturing uh, in the US as well so in, in a way it's, it's kind of sidestepping and, and sidestepping current supply issues but also looking at developing a whole new battery industry in the US which is a massive market as well. And, and I'm sure the uptake is very similar to Australia is going to be high in the US as well once the infrastructure is all established. Uh, so that's one aspect to it. Um, in terms of growth potential, I look at all the, you know, the, the data supplied through you know, various uh, consultancies and you know, they're seeing a 10 times uplift in requirement for manganese um, between now and the end of uh, you know, the, you know, 2030, 2035. So that's a significant amount of manganese that needs to be produced. And they, they actually predict that it needs to come from outside of China as well to, to, to support um, you know, the manufacture globally uh, across the US and, and, um, and Europe. 
And thirdly, um, the technology for these batteries is evolving. So you've got the nickel manganese cobalt batteries, which is, tends to be a bit of an accepted platform these days. But what's emerging is lithium iron phosphate with manganese, so LFMP batteries, and that's a new one. And they'll be going into cheaper vehicles or bulk storage that you might have in your home. And the beauty of adding manganese to that uh, current chemistry is that it increases the energy density, but also at a small cost. Um, you don't need to add nickel, you know, it's just manganese, so it is a cheaper option. Mm. And uh, also sodium batteries, um, another bulk storage uh, technology that is coming into play. And, and they also have a significant component of manganese as well. So I just love reading about these different batteries that are coming, uh, coming to the market and uh, when they're coming to the market. And it's imminent, you know, these things are happening, you know, they're designing the batteries now into production and manufacturing over the next two years. And, and you know, that's also suits quite well with our timing in terms of being being there to supply that negative sulfate into the future. And I can just imagine the uh, the new Energizer Bunny ads that would be popping up these days. It literally would continue for hours and hours before we could even get the 30 second commercial kind of going. So yeah. uh, it's um, a very interesting space how far the technology has advanced. But yeah, shouldn't ignore actually alkaline batteries. Now this is significant amount of manganese in our alkaline batteries as well, which is just your stock standard. Mm. You know, kids put them in toys all over the world and there's still a quite a lot of um, demand for uh, manganese just through that as well. well. So Brennan, what are your goals for 2023 with Black Canyon Resources? Yeah, with, um, I mean, I can sort of break it down to a couple of aspects uh, for 2023. Exploration, we're still an explorer. We've got two and a half thousand square kilometers of tenure. Uh, up there in the eastern Pilbara, um, 800 square k's is in joint venture and the rest of it uh, is, is 100% owned by, by Black Canyon. So we'll be spending money on those tenements and potentially making new discoveries. Uh, we also know that um, we've done preliminary mapping across those and geochemistry. So we, we do have targets that we want to follow up. So we will be doing some drilling and, and further exploration on those targets. Flanagan Bore, um, which is really the flagship project at this stage, is really working through that feasibility work. So that involves um, getting that net test work right to ensure that we can produce a consistent concentrate from, from materials on site. And in parallel, running through the approvals process, um, starting all those environmental baseline studies, the ESG component for the projects as well, which is really important because we did lodge a mining license application uh, over the project in November last year, so um, you know that to get that through the to get that through the approvals process um, and the regulators, that's probably a good 12 uh, 12 month uh, uh, you know 12 months doing baseline studies and, and then the approval process through there. So we'll be kicking off that but with the high purity manganese sulfate as well. Um, looking at that across the portfolio and, and just seeing um, seeing how we can develop our flow sheet to produce battery grade high purity manganese sulfate. Um, so yeah, we, we, we do have a pretty full uh, full 12 months ahead of us. Um, so it'll be more of the same. Um, and and we, we're a pretty small team as well and, and we're quite nimble. So we, we, we can also uh, react to markets and, and, and so forth. But um, like it's, it's, yeah, we, we had a fantastic 2022 and I guess I dare say it'll be another, uh, another big one in 2023. Now that there's no doubt about it, I know how you guys operate. You're very cost effective and cost efficient. So it should be an incredible year for you. And Brendan, it's been great to chat, but just before I let you go, uh, any final thoughts you'd like to leave with our audience and your shareholders? Oh, look, I think, um, you know, we are really showing value uh, in, 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 the, in the workflows that we're processing through, through the company. Um, I had to say ticking the boxes, but you know that's what you do need to do with with company, with you know project developments, and we are working our way through those as well. So we are you know really one of those companies that you know we do what we say we're going to do and we go ahead. So and I think 2022 is testament to that. Um, you know what we've set out to achieve, we've achieved, and, and now 2023 is a is a whole new year ahead of us, and, and we'll be just continuing on, going further and stronger in in, in the next 12 months. Incredible, Brendan. I wish you all the best of success with Black Canyon Resources. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, James. Talking That's Brendan soon. Cummins, the Executive Director at Black Canyon Resources. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Calco Media. So make sure to subscribe. I'm James Preston, reminding you to stay prize and invest wise with Calco Media. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. 
Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Barely two in five people believe their families will be better off in the future, according to a regular global survey that also identified growing levels of distrust in institutions among low-income households. The Edelman Trust Barometer, which for over two decades has polled the attitudes of thousands of people, found that economic pessimism was at its highest in some of the world's top economies, such as the United States, Britain, Germany and Japan. It further confirmed how societies have been divided by the impacts of the pandemic and inflation. Higher income households still broadly trust institutions such as government, business, media and NGOs. But alienation is rife amongst low income groups. Globally, only 40% agree with the statement, my family and I will be better off in five years, compared to 50% a year before. With advanced economies most downbeat, the United States 36%, Britain 23%, Germany 15% and Japan just 9%. Fast growing economies saw much higher scores, albeit lower than last year, with only China bucking the trend with a 1 percentage point rise to 65% despite the economic disruption caused by its now relaxed zero Covid policies. Such anxieties reflect deep uncertainty about the state of the global economy as the Ukraine war continues and central banks hike their lending rates to tame inflation. The World Bank on Tuesday warned it could tip into recession this year. While Edelman's long-standing trust index registered an average 63% trust level in key institutions among high-income US respondents, that figure fell to just 40% among low-income groups. Similar income-based divergences were present in Saudi Arabia, China, Japan and the United Arab Emirates. Alright, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine Media. Right now, Calkine is offering a 7-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Sainsbury's, Britain's second biggest supermarket group, has linked up with online meal ordering and delivery firm Just Eat Takeaway to add faster home delivery for groceries across the country. Shoppers will be able to order items from Sainsbury's for delivery in under 30 minutes using the Just Eat app. The partnership will launch with more than 175 stores by the end of February, with a further rollout across the country in 2023. Sainsbury's has its own online delivery service, including its Chop Chop service that delivers in 60 minutes. Just Eat already has partnership deals in Britain with Asda, the UK's number three supermarket group, wholesaler Booker, which is part of market leader Tesco, and fast food group Greggs. Last week, Sainsbury's reported better than expected Christmas trading. According to market researcher Nielsen IQ, while online sales rose 2.8% in December, such sales fell to 10.4% of the UK grocery market versus 11.2% in December 2021. Alright, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine Media. Right now, Calkine is offering a 7-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe.
Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. As Canadian inflation slows, the cost of essentials such as food and rent offers pointers as to whether it will return sustainably to the Bank of Canada's 2% target, according to economists, as those items are key drivers of inflation expectations. Canada's Consumer Price Index report for December, due on Tuesday, is expected to show headline inflation cooling to 6.3%, its lowest annual rate since last February from 6.8% in November. That's good news for the economy, but analysts say that much of the slowdown will be due to energy prices and they don't expect much improvement in the annual rate of underlying inflation. Their focus is on the breadth of price increases as well as more timely three-month rates of core inflation and items in the CPI basket that are essential to consumers. Price increases for food and rent, as well as those for gas, which have already slowed, are highly visible, so they tend to have a pronounced impact on inflation expectations. If inflation expectations rise, it could push up wage demands, particularly in a tight labour market, leading to further price pressures. According to Capital Economics, Stephen Brown, central banks are transitioning to the idea that inflation will fall, but he's not convinced something less than 2% will be sustained. Brown's estimate for CPI trim, one of the BOC's preferred measures of core inflation, to increase 5.3% on an annual basis in December, matching November's pace. The Bank of Canada has vowed to return inflation to target, raising its benchmark interest rate at a record pace of 400 basis points in nine months to 4.25%. Money markets see a roughly 70% chance that it hikes by a further quarter point at an interest rate decision on January 25. Food prices rose 10.3% year over year in November, and shelter was up by 7.2%, while the December Labor Force survey showed growth in average hourly wages of 5.1%. Brown added that high inflation is having some impact on wages at the moment, but that it is far too early to tell whether there will be impacts into 2024 and beyond. Alright, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Right now, Kalkar is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data driven market insights combined with an in depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. China's end to a sweeping crackdown on its video game market is expected to breathe life back into the battered industry this year. But remaining restrictions on some content and economic headwinds will limit the extent of the recovery. Beijing's tough curbs in 2021 laid waste to the once booming industry, shaving over half of the market value of sector leaders like Tencent Holdings and NetEase Incorporated, and shrinking the world's biggest gaming market for the first time. Shares of Tencent, the world's largest gaming company, and NetEase rose this week after China's video games regulator granted the first gaming licenses in 2023, the latest sign that the clampdown is ending. 
analysts expect China to approve between 800 and 900 games this year, potentially more, topping the 512 titles released in 2021 and 755 in 2022. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Between August 2021 and March 2022, no titles were approved. Analysts from JP Morgan stated that the financial manager believes the approvals indicate a more benign regulatory environment for the China gaming industry. With rich game supply, JP Morgan is more positive on overall online game market growth during Chinese New Year, a traditional strong season for the China online game market. The crackdown was aimed at curbing gaming addiction among youth and purging content the government did not approve of, with companies asked to delete content that was violent, deemed to celebrate wealth or foster the worship of celebrities. That sent game sales in China tumbling more than 10% to 40.1 billion US dollars in 2022, the first decline since figures became available in 2003, according to a report by CNG, a government-backed industry data firm. In November last year, Tencent, the world's biggest gaming company, reported its domestic gaming revenue shrank 7% in the third quarter. Its overall gaming revenue fell by 4.45%. Shares of Tencent, China's most valuable company, dropped 24.7% in 2022, but have risen 21% so far this year, recouping nearly all of last year's losses. NetEase's Hong Kong stock, which dropped 27.3% in 2022, is up 21.4% for this year. Alright, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calkai Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. British multinational oil and gas company Shell says its QGC business, which develops methane reserves within Queensland, plans to offer additional gas for the Australian market. Now, this would amount to around eight petajoules for delivery in 2023. Shell's offer comes on the heels of a legislation passed by the Australian government that set a price cap on natural gas which will apply to new wholesale gas sales by East Coast producers for one year. The price cap provision, which met with fierce opposition from suppliers in Australia's East Coast market, including global major ExxonMobil Corp and Shell, was placed at $12 per gigajoule. Now, gas producers and analysts have warned that the new law will lead to market chaos, with producers already withholding supply offers while they assess its impact. Shell says the volume is in a in addition to the 20 petajoules of gas offered domestically since December 2022 at or below $12 per gigajoule, which of over 13 petajoules has been contracted. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Highlighting the need for a policy environment that encourages new supplies in close proximity to the demand point, the company added, squeezing gas from the north to the south is neither a sustainable nor affordable way to supply customers in southern markets. Based on current production forecasts, the company added that its unit is anticipating the availability of additional gas for delivery to domestic customers as the year progresses. So what do you think? You can leave a comment below you can like and subscribe to our channel and you can press that bell icon to get notifications for our other videos. I'm Rachel for Calkine Media.
If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Cryptocurrency, also known as digital or virtual currency, has been gaining popularity in recent years as a form of alternative investment and payment. However, there is ongoing debate about whether or not cryptocurrency should be subject to the same regulations as traditional finance. Proponents of stricter regulations argue that cryptocurrency can be used for illegal activities such as money laundering and fraud. They argue that these activities can be prevented or at least limited through proper regulations, similar to those in traditional finance. Additionally, regulations can provide consumers with greater protection against financial losses and scams. Opponents of strict regulations argue that cryptocurrency is decentralized and operates outside of traditional financial systems. They argue that traditional regulations are not suitable for the unique characteristics of cryptocurrency and may stifle innovation. Additionally, they argue that the transparency and immutability of the blockchain technology that underlies most cryptocurrencies makes it difficult for bad actors to operate anonymously. Another argument is that cryptocurrency is a new technology and that it's still evolving. There are many new use cases that are still being discovered and the regulations that are put in place today may not be suitable for tomorrow. This can make it difficult for regulators to keep up with the changes in the industry and to create regulations that are effective and not too restrictive. Ultimately, the question of whether cryptocurrency should be subject to the same regulations as traditional finance is a very complex one. While there are valid arguments for both sides, it is important for regulators to take a balanced approach in order to protect consumers and prevent illegal activities, whilst also encouraging innovation and growth in the industry. The cryptocurrency industry is still relatively new and it's rapidly evolving. Therefore, it's important for regulators to keep a close eye on it and to consider the unique characteristics of the technology when creating regulations. All right, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Australia is to accelerate plans to buy advanced sea mines to protect its maritime routes and ports from potential aggressors. That's amid China's plans to increase its influence in the Pacific region. The so-called smart sea mines are designed to differentiate between military targets and other types of ships, a Defence Department spokesperson said in a statement. The statement also said the acquisition of smart sea mines will help to secure sea lines of communication and protect Australia's maritime approach. A modern sea mining capability is a significant deterrent to potential aggressors, though the Defence Department did not specify any further details. A report in the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper on Monday said Canberra would spend up to $1 billion to procure the high-tech underwater weapons. The federal government will soon announce a contract to buy a substantial number of sea mines from a European weapons supplier, the report said, citing unidentified defence industry sources.
Prime Minister Anthony Albanese told ABC television he would not preempt those national security issues. He said, what we need to make sure we have the best possible defences. So we've looked at missile defence, we're looking at cyber security, and we're looking at all of these issues. China has plans to step up its presence in the Pacific and entered a security pact with Solomon Islands last year, raising concerns in the United States and Australia who for decades have seen the region as their sphere of influence. Australia has been looking to boost its defence spending over the past few years, including entering into a deal in 2021 to buy nuclear submarines from the United States and Britain. So what do you think? You can leave a comment below, you can like and subscribe to our channel, and you can press the bell icon to get notifications for our other videos. I'm Rachel for Kaukai Media. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calcon. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. If you look at the growth of blockchain, you would see that the technology only rose to popularity due to its link with the groundbreaking aspect that is Bitcoin. Bitcoin and blockchain were two concepts that were used identically by many people throughout the world until recently. However, as the world has become more familiar with the technology, the gap between blockchain and Bitcoin has widened and various ideal use cases for blockchain have evolved without the usage of cryptocurrency. Blockchain is a set of records known as blocks that are used to store data openly and chronologically. The information contained within the blocks is encrypted, ensuring the privacy and security of both users and data. Blockchain technology, also known as distributed ledger technology, holds public transactional records in various databases linked by peer-to-peer -peer nodes. A block is a transactional record in blockchain technology. The blocks are stored in several databases known as chains, and the storage is referred to as a digital ledger. Simply said, every transaction is a ledger that is authorised by the owner's digital signature, which not only authenticates the transaction, but also prevents it from being tampered with. On that note, let's look at five blockchain use cases that extend beyond crypto. Healthcare. Blockchains used to preserve health records, conduct clinical trials, monitor patients, enhance safety, show information and increase transparency. It keeps hospital financial statements updated while reducing data translation, time and expense. Blockchain enables enterprises to provide proper patient care as well as access to high quality health care facilities. This system swiftly resolves health information exchange, which is a substantial strain owing to its time-consuming and repetitive nature. According to Deloitte, blockchain's technology has the potential to improve healthcare by putting the patient at the core of the healthcare ecosystem and improving health database security, privacy and interoperability. This technology might establish a new model for health information exchanges by creating more efficient disintermediated and secure electronic medical data. While not a cure-all, this new and quickly expanding subject offers fertile ground for exploration, investment and proof-of-concept testing. 
Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Banking. Traditional banks and lenders underwrite mortgages using a credit reporting system. P2P loans complicated programmed loans that can resemble a mortgage or syndicated loan structure and a quicker and more secure lending procedure in general are all made possible by blockchain technology. Blockchain at its heart is a ledger that provides insight into a whole life cycle of a transaction or value exchange inside a bank's activities. It can eliminate the need for costly and time consuming third party verifications throughout the payment or money transfer procedure. Blockchain technology is being used by banks such as JP Morgan, the Swedish Central Bank and HSBC. Internet of Things. The combination of Internet of Things or IoT with blockchain offers new opportunities that cut inefficiencies, strengthen security and increase transparency for all parties associated while allowing safe machine-to-machine -machine transactions. The growing number of IoT devices and connections that are vulnerable to cybercrime has encouraged the establishment of blockchain technology. The advantages of blockchain IoT include faster data updates at lower prices, more privacy and more effective logistics, supply chain and insurance. Government and public sector, individuals, corporations and governments exchange resources via a distributed ledger encrypted by cryptography in a blockchain-based government model. This framework removes a single point of failure and safeguards critical public and government data from the start. Governments may use blockchain to decrease administrative expenses, boost transparency and improve service delivery. One should expect to see even more ingenious applications of blockchain technology in the rendering of public services as more governments adopt it. Cybersecurity. When it comes to the cloud and traditional computer network usage, centralized servers are typically employed to retain data. Storing all of your company data on a centralized system exposes you to dangers like corruption, data loss, human error and hackers. However, when you place your data on a distributed, decentralized system using the blockchain as a service model, the number of hacks drops dramatically. Thanks so much for watching. Please do like, share, comment, keep watching for more market insights and business news. Sage for Calgary Media. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Hi there, I'm James Preston for Kaokai Media. Cryptocurrencies, also known as digital or virtual currencies, have been gaining popularity in recent years. Two common types of cryptocurrencies are coins and tokens. While they may seem similar at first glance, there's actually some important differences between the two. A cryptocurrency coin, such as Bitcoin or Litecoin, is a standalone digital currency that functions independently of any other platform. Coins are designed to be used as a medium of exchange, similar to traditional fiat currencies like the US dollar or the euro. They can be bought and sold on cryptocurrency exchanges and their value is determined by market supply and demand. Now on the other hand, a cryptocurrency token is built on top of another blockchain platform such as Ethereum. Tokens are often used to represent assets or utility within a specific ecosystem, such as a virtual gaming item or a loyalty point system. Tokens are not meant to be used as a standalone currency, but rather as a digital representation of something else. For example, Bitcoin is a coin. It's a standalone currency which can be used as a medium of exchange. While ERC20 is a token which is built on the Ethereum blockchain. 
and it's used to represent assets or utility within a specific ecosystem like a gaming item or a loyalty point system. So in summary, coins are standalone digital currencies, while tokens are digital assets that are built on top of another platform. Both have their own unique uses and can be used in different ways, but they are not interchangeable. Understanding the differences between coins and tokens is important for anyone interested in investing or using cryptocurrencies. Alright, that's all for this video, but let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Cowkind Media. Right now, Calkine is offering a 7-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The ACCC has this week started a sweep to identify misleading testimonials and endorsements by social media influencers. We would also look at more than 100 influencers mentioned in over 150 tip-offs from consumers who responded to the ACCC's Facebook post asking for information. Now, most of the tip-offs from members of the public were about influences in beauty and lifestyle, as well as parenting and fashion, failing to disclose their affiliation with the product or company they're promoting. The sweep has been run over the coming weeks as part of the ACCC's compliance and enforcement priorities for 2022 to 2023, with the broad aim of identifying deceptive marketing practices across the digital economy. As part of the sweep, the ACCC team is reviewing a range of social media platforms, including Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube and Facebook, and live streaming service Twitch. The sweep is targeting sectors where influencer marketing is particularly widespread fashion, beauty, cosmetics, food and beverage, travel, health and fitness and well-being, parenting, gaming and technology. In conducting the sweep, the ACCC is also considering the role of other parties such as advertisers, marketers, brands and social media platforms in facilitating misconduct. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. ACCC Chair Gina Cass Gottlieb says, with Australians choosing to shop online, consumers often rely on reviews and testimonials when making purchases, but misleading endorsements can be very harmful. The ACCC will not hesitate to take action when they see consumers are at risk of being misled or deceived by a testimonial and there is potential for significant harm. Many consumers are aware that influencers receive a financial benefit for promoting products and services. However, the ACCC remains concerned that influencers, advertisers and brands try to hide this fact from consumers, which prevents them from making informed choices. This can particularly apply to micro-influencers with smaller followings as they can build and maintain a more seemingly authentic relationship with followers to add legitimacy to hidden advertising posts. The ACCC is therefore monitoring a mix of small and larger influencers in the sweep. This sweep follows a similar incentive carried out in 2022, which focused on identifying misleading online reviews and testimonials posted on businesses' websites, their social media pages and third-party review platforms. A report outlining the findings from 2022 will be published in the coming months. So what do you think? Does more need to be done to crack down on influencers? You can leave a comment below. You can also like and subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to get video notifications. I'm Rachel for Calkine Media. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now.
Rebalancing is the process of realigning the weightings of a financial asset portfolio. It involves buying and selling resources in a portfolio on a regular basis to maintain a specific or desired level of resource designation or risk. For example, the initial capital structure goal was to have half stocks and half bonds. If the stocks had fared well over the period, the portfolio's equity weighting might have been increased to 70%. The financial supporter may then sell a couple of stocks and repurchase bonds in order to achieve the portfolio's first objective distribution of 50-50. Portfolio rebalancing protects the financial backer from being unnecessarily exposed to risks. Furthermore, rebalancing ensures that the portfolio holdings remain within the risk tolerance of the management. These measures are frequently implemented to ensure that the risk level is at the appropriate level for the financial backer. As stock performance is more volatile than securities, the position of stock resources will alter in response to economic conditions. Along with the exhibition variable, financial backers may alter the overall risk in their portfolios to fulfill shifting monetary needs. Rebalancing as a word refers to the even distribution of resources, however a 50-50 stock and bond split is not required. While there is no set schedule for rebalancing a portfolio, most plans examine classifications at least once a year. Possible to forego portfolio rebalancing. Rebalancing allows financial backers to sell high and buy cheap, taking profits from well-performing businesses and reinvesting them in areas that have not yet seen as rapid growth. Calendar rebalancing is the most basic method of rebalancing. This process entails analyzing the speculative assets in the portfolio at predetermined intervals and modifying them after the first allotment at an optimal recurrence. Monthly and quarterly assessments are rarely used because rebalancing would be too expensive week after week. At the same time, a yearly approach would consider a large amount of modest portfolio float. The optimal recurrence of rebalancing is still being determined since time constraints, exchange costs and permissible float determinant. Calendar rebalancing has a substantial advantage over more responsive solutions because it's less time consuming and costly for the financial backer. It has fewer exchanges and does not have predetermined dates. The downside is that it does not consider rebalancing at various rates regardless of how much the market fluctuates. A more responsive approach to rebalancing revolves around the permitted percentage of a resource in a portfolio which is known as a constant mix strategy in groups or passages. Each resource class or individual security is assigned an objective weight and a resistance range for comparison. Constant proportion portfolio insurance is the most often used advanced rebalancing approach. That's the type of portfolio insurance in which the financial backer decides on the monetary value of their portfolio and then builds resource allocation around that decision. In constant proportion portfolio insurance, the resource classes are adapted as an unsafe resource and a conventional resource of one or more money, reciprocals or depository securities. The outcome of the CPPI approach is similar to that of acquiring an engineered considered option that does not make use of genuine choice agreements. CPPI is frequently referred to as a concave methodology rather than a concave strategy such as a constant mix. The portions inside their retirement accounts are perhaps the most well-known areas in which financial backers try to adjust. Resource execution influences overall value and many financial backers choose to donate more strongly when they're younger and less forcefully as they approach retirement age. When the financial backer intends to draw down the assets to offer retirement income, the portfolio is often at its most traditionalist. Depending on market performance, financial supporters may be able to locate a large number of current resources held inside a single location. 
Rebalancing permits the financial supporter to transfer a portion of the assets now held in stock X to another speculation, whether it be a larger quantity of stock Y or repurchasing another stock entirely. By diversifying the portfolio over multiple entities, a fall in one will be counted to some extent by the activities of the others, providing a degree of portfolio soundness. So what do you think? If you like this information, you can like and subscribe to our channel. You can also hit the bell icon to get notifications for our other videos. I'm Rachel for Kalki Media. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. India's Adani Enterprises began a record $2.45 billion secondary share sale for retail investors on Friday, days after the conglomerate was attacked by a short seller. Controlled by one of the world's richest men, the Adani Group firms lost $11 billion in market capitalization on Wednesday after New York-based Hindenburg Research flagged concerns in a report about debt levels and the use of tax havens. The Adani Group dismissed the report as baseless. It was spun off its power, coal, transmission and green energy businesses in recent years. But what is the Adani Group and why are we seeing it in the news so much? Well, it's one of India's biggest conglomerates owned by Gautam Adani, the world's fourth richest man, according to Forbes. And he's been diversifying his empire from ports to energy and now owns a media company. Adani Enterprises, the flagship company of a conglomerate, aims to use the share sale proceeds for capital expenditure and to pay debt. The anchor portion of the sale saw participation from investors, including the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, on Wednesday. The Adani Group says it is spinning off more businesses by 2028 and dismisses any debt concerns floating in the market. So where does the Adani Group stand in terms of debt? Well, in its report, Hindenburg says key listed Adani Group companies had substantial debt, putting the conglomerate on a precarious financial footing, and that sky-high valuations had pushed the share prices of seven listed Adani companies as much as 85% beyond actual value. Hindenburg said it held short positions in Adani through its US-traded bonds and non-Indian traded derivative instruments, meaning it's a betting that their price would fall. The Adani Group has repeatedly faced and dismissed concern about debt levels. It's reported the Adani Group's consolidated gross debt stood at 1.9 trillion rupees, that's 23.34 billion US dollars. Now, if you like the information in this video, please like and subscribe to our channel and you can hit the bell icon to get notifications for our other videos. I'm Rachel for Kalkine Media. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. China's business confidence has fallen to its lowest level since January of 2013, according to a survey by World Economics on Monday, reflecting the impact of surging COVID cases on economic activity with the abrupt lifting of many pandemic control measures. The index fell to 48.1 in December from 51.8 in November, the lowest since the survey began in 2013. The results were among the first indicators of how business sentiment has taken a hit in the world's second biggest economy after the sharp relaxation of strict COVID containment measures on the 7th of December, triggering a still growing wave of domestic COVID cases across China. World well, Economics said that the survey suggests strongly that the growth rate of the Chinese economy has slowed quite dramatically, 
and may be heading for recession in 2023. China's GDP is expected to grow just 3% this year, its worst performance in nearly half a century. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. The survey showed business activity fell sharply in December, with the sales managers indexes in manufacturing and service sectors broke below the 50 level. China has recently dismantled some key parts of the world's toughest anti-COVID curbs and lockdowns. The measures were championed by President Xi Jinping, but impaired the economy and sparked popular protests unprecedented in his decade-long rule. The top leaders and policymakers will focus on stabilizing the economy in 2023 and stepping up policy adjustments to ensure key targets are met, according to an agenda-setting meeting ending on Friday. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Build better relationships, get connected, heard and noticed. We always believe in getting you the best. Calkine Media's growing platform, Calkine TV, helps you connect to an inquisitive audience from across the globe. Interact in a trusted environment. Showcase your brand on Calkine TV in a seamless and effective manner. We connect and curate content as per your business needs. So why wait? Write to us at guestteam at calkine.com.au. Are you an investor looking for premium market opportunities? Presenting premium and exclusive service for investors by Calkine. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and this is Calkine TV's Trending News. Now, Australian retail turnover fell 3.9% in December 2022. That's according to figures released today by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. This follows a 1.7% rise in November. Retail turnover remains elevated at its sixth highest level in the series and was up 7.5% throughout the year. The large fall in December suggests that retail spending is slowing due to the high cost of living pressures. Retail businesses reported that many consumers had responded to these pressures by doing more Christmas shopping in November to take advantage of heavy promotional activity and discounting such as the part of the Black Friday sales event. Turnover fell in industries previously boosted by November Black Friday sales. Department stores had the largest fall, down 14.3%, followed by clothing, footwear and personal accessory retailing, down 13.1%. Household goods retailing was down 7.8%, another retailing down 4.6%. Food retailing was the only industry to record a rise in December, up 0.3 percent, while cafes, restaurants and takeaway food services were relatively unchanged from November. Retail turnover fell across all states and territories, with the majority down by more than 3 percent. Well, that's the latest economic news from Calkine TV. I'm Rachel, signing off for now. The economy is evolving with a shift in values after the pandemic and Calkine Media's Crypto Buzz covers the future of money, banking and digital currencies. Are you interested in crypto, DeFi and NFTs? Well, do your homework, gain a scam radar and find yourself in the market as you explore what the crypto sector can offer. 
Watch Kalkai Media's Crypto Buzz for a weekly wrap-up of the overarching themes in trending cryptos, headwinds from the regulators, and with the use, cases and innovations explained by expert guests. Watch Crypto Buzz for your weekly fix of the prominent crypto news from the world. With me, Sage, from Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Italy is set to scrap part of its plans to facilitate cash payments for goods and services after criticism from European Union authorities, according to Economy Minister Giancarlo Giorgetti. In its draft 2023 budget, the government had proposed changing the current system in which sellers risk fines if they refuse to accept card payments by saying no penalties would be imposed for transactions below 60 euros. The move drew criticism from the European Commission, which said it was not consistent with previous EU recommendations to Italy to boost tax compliance. And Jurgetti told Parliament late on Sunday that the government had backtracked. The minister said that Italy intends to eliminate the measure on points of sales and some sort of compensatory measures may be introduced to help shopkeepers pay the commission fees on card transactions. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. But critics say that cash payments encourage tax dodges in a country where around 100 billion euros in taxes and social contributions are evaded every year according to Treasury data. The current fines, which amount to 30 euros plus 4% of the value of the transaction, were one of the conditions for a 21 billion euro tranche on the EU's post-COVID recovery fund money that Rome secured in the first half of this year. Despite the latest developments, Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney, who took office in October, continues to be the more indulgent towards cash than her predecessors. Her first budget, which must be approved by Parliament before year's end, raises a limit on cash payments to €5,000 from next year, up from a previous ceiling of 1000 Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Calchime Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Vincent Kandrabanata. He's the founder of Renovatio Bioscience. Now, Renovatio develops nutritional supplements that are world leading in their purity and effectiveness. So here to tell us more is Dr. Vincent. Hello today. Hi, good morning, Rachel. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Great to speak with you today. We're very interested to hear more about your company. Now, you do offer one of the most potent broad-spectrum dietary antioxidants made from apples. 
Could you please elaborate on this painted technology and how you came about discovering this? That's correct, and I'll do you one better. It is the most potent dietary antioxidant on the planet. And the reason why we have the confidence in saying that was because the company was born out of research at the University of Newcastle, Australia, and it was a joint research with the Department of Primary Industries New South Wales. In 2010, I led the research team to figure out how to revolutionize the technique in the extraction of phenolic antioxidants from natural sources, in this case, apples. Before my technology came along, there are only two ways to create antioxidant supplements. The first one was synthesizing it in the lab, and the second one was to extract these antioxidants using chemical solvents such as acetone, methanol, and ethanol. And the issue with both of these uh, technologies at that time was that the absorption rate in the body was only between three to five percent. And that's the reason why we use the word potency, because when people say the word the most powerful or the highest concentration uh, antioxidants, those are marketing terms that cannot be defined scientifically, because it doesn't really matter how high or how powerful an antioxidant is. What matters is that what your body can absorb. Using my technology, which is patented, uh, the absorption rate of this antioxidant supplement goes from 3 to 5% all the way up to 97% in our body. And that's the reason why we can say that it is the most potent dietary antioxidant because it is natural, it's extracted from 100% of strand apples, and it's absorbable and therefore usable by your body. And what pushed you to do the research into this area to help you find out about this? Well, uh, it came from uh, my passion working with uh, Australian apple farmers. Back in 2009, 2010, our apple farmers were struggling competing with imported products, fruit products, including uh, fruit juices from overseas. And it was so bad to the point where even if they got their uh, fruits, in this case, apples for free, they were not able to actually produce things as cheaply as uh, imported products. So my research team was tasked with, with, with one goal to find out the, the benefits and, and, and the competitive edge of what Australian produce can offer. And, and, and our apples come from a region in New South Wales called Orange. And it's quite funny, apples from Orange. And uh, the growing condition is so good to, to give you the best, the best things that apples can offer because of the volcanic soil, the, sp the specific climate that needs to be, to, that is required by the plants to produce a high concentration of antioxidants uh, to start with, coupled with our technology, we are offering and showcasing uh, the best apples in the world, which is from uh, Orange Region, New South Wales. And I'm very proud to be, to be representing our primary industries, including our farmers in the on the world stage. That is fascinating. And, and what ways are phenolics powerful antioxidants for the body? So um, uh, to, to also pick up on your uh, previous question, the research started with that, uh, with that goal. However, to, to make the jump or the transition from being a scientist and researcher into being in the, in the business world, being an entrepreneur, uh, was actually due to the experience that I had with my grandma. When I went back to Indonesia, I was born in Indonesia and I came to Australia for my, uh, to study my degree. I went back to Indonesia. I saw my grandma was basically wheelchair bound because of the severe joint pain on both of her knees. And at that time in 2012, I only just uh, invented the technology and I told her that I have something from my lab that will help you. If you, if you trust me enough, uh, please take it. And uh, three months later, she, she and my grandpa came to visit me in Australia and uh, she was walking six kilometers a day. And at that time, uh, that was very moving for me because um, I basically changed someone's life. And the reason why I, I went into research, I wanted to be a researcher, was to use what I know to change the world, in this, in this case, making it healthier. And that is reflected in the name that I chose for my company, which is Renovatio. In Latin, Renovatio means new life. And, and it is our, our goal, our mission to give people a new life in the way that they can be healthier and happier. 
It's amazing that your company has helped you um, and helped your loved ones. It's a phenomenal story. Now, you have a multi-million dollar expansion deal with Woolworths. What can you tell me about this and what does that mean for your company? Yeah, uh, it is both a personal achievement as well as a career-defining moment for me uh, when we partner with Woolworths. I, I have to say we have been very fortunate to partner with a retail giant, the, the, the largest retailer in Australia, uh, who who understand what I'm trying to achieve, what what, what my dreams are, and they uh, after the initial success of rolling out our core products, which is the activated phenolics powder, an, an Apple Day tablets, as well as the Immunity Plus tablets, they then partner up with us in terms of finding out what other products that can help people, and in this case, uh, we propose to them and they accept it two new products in the, in the in the five minutes category which is mental resilience and skin remedy the reason why i chose uh to, to to further research into creating a product called mental resilience is because with covid um the instability of the world a natural disaster i really think that it is, it is important for us to remember that we need help in terms of not only physically but also mentally to help uh, australians to to be more resilient in terms of their uh, mental health and putting more spotlight into the importance of mental well-being. And I think we are one of the first, if not the first company that comes up with uh, this formulation and putting it on the shelves. We, we really want to fight the stigma that uh, you, need, you, you need to struggle on your own. We want to, to, to let people know that it is, you can pick up your your, your, your groceries while picking up mental resilience in, in, in the supermarket in terms of boosting that re resiliency, helping you with fighting mild anxiety and stress, improving your sleep. And the same goes with a skin remedy. A lot of people think that when we branch out to skincare, it is only about vanity, but it goes, it goes deeper than just skin deep because uh, skin health is really important, especially coming from a place where when I was younger, I I fought a battle with cystic acne as well as rosacea, and it really took a toll on my confidence, my mental health. So I think uh, taking care of our skin, having a good, healthy skin really goes beyond just the vanity aspect. It helps people with mild uh, eczema, with psoriasis, with dermatitis, acne and pimple. And I think as much as um, it helps from the outside, it's also important uh, to, to boost that from the inside. Absolutely. Now, how can a consumer ensure that a product is safe and healthy for them? Can people become more aware while they're shopping, especially, uh, you mentioned their beauty care products? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it is really important to choose a products from companies that put research at the forefront of its mission. Unlike other companies, our company were, uh, was not founded we found it because we want to sell product. Uh, we started with research. We started with the, a piece of technology, home, homegrown uh, new technology uh, invented uh, by, by uh, Australian research team by, in, in, in a leading uh, Australian university. And I think that puts a lot of credibility to what we put out because people can go and research the technology behind that. We have a, we have always make we have always uh, making sure that people understand about technology, the difference between our product and other people's product. And not only that, uh, especially for our skincare range, we also have the, uh, the Ultra Serum, which, uh, which is really something that people can try and see the difference even, even after uh, the first use. And we did study on this. And I think it is very important for us being in the health and beauty industry to make sure that our product has integrity because we are not only representing our company, we are representing Australia as, as, as a whole. And, and, and I think uh, being Australian made from 100% Australian apples, that every step of the way in the, in the production of our uh, products has that level of quality control because as you know, um, we sometimes probably some of us take it for granted that we, we live in a country where the produce is safe, the quality control is, is, is of high standard, but that Australian made and grown uh, label or certification that we have really put that uh, seal of 
seal of approval in terms of quality, especially when we export our products to, to the international market. And just lastly, Vincent, what are your objectives for Renovatio Bioscience for this year, for 2022? I really think that uh, we are a company that has a big dream. Our dream is to give people an opportunity to have a happier and healthier life. We, we are the forefront of preventative healthcare in terms of making sure that people understand the importance of fighting inflammation. Our body is made of trillions of cells. So if we take care of the health of our cells, it will manifest in terms of our health physically as well as mentally. And I really would like uh, to invite people to, to find out more about our products because when you purchase our product, you're not only supporting us, you're supporting your health and you're also supporting Australian apple farmers. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Rachel. Have a great day. Thank you, you too. And that was Dr. Vincent Kendra-Winata. He's founder of Renovatio Bioscience. And if you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Calkine Media. So make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space, and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Shares in Australia's star entertainment group tumbled nearly 12% on Monday after the New South Wales government proposed to raise taxes on casino poker machine operators in the state from July next year. The potential gaming tax changes, which will affect Star's operations in Sydney, which made up half of its revenue in fiscal 2022, according to its annual report, could raise an additional $364 million over the next three years if implemented. New South Wales Treasurer Matt Keane said on Saturday the money raised will be used to help fund vital services like helping communities recover from the impacts of COVID-19, bushfires and floods. The move comes amid increased efforts to reform Australia's gambling industry, which has been rolled in damning reports of sidestepping anti-money laundering rules, dysfunctional governance and poor corporate culture. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Star Entertainment Group said in a statement on Monday that it had not been consulted by the New South Wales government on the matter and that it is seeking to urgently engage with the government as to the sustainability of the proposed tax changes and the impact on the star's business. The company's shares hit their lowest since April of 23rd, 2020. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Hoy Shields for Calcine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now.
Welcome to Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Hemant Mehta. He is the CEO and the founder of OpenBI, or OpenBI, which is a global innovation platform that provides a suite of solutions to help businesses of all sizes and developers from different backgrounds to simplify their data journey and basically automate essential business processes to save hours of manual labor with the help of business intelligence, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. So here to tell us more is the founder and CEO, Hemant Mehta. Welcome to the show, Hemant. Thank you for having me today on your show, Sage. We're so glad you're to be with us. Yes, please. No, please go ahead. No, you're absolutely correct. So, so we help companies to find insights and uh, help them with their data discovery. Wonderful. So let's dive in and find out a bit more, Hemant. Everything starts with data these days. We can't ignore that fact. And you help people in this journey. Would you please talk about the tools you provide that enable people to use data easily? Yes, absolutely. So there are tons and tons of data around us. Uh, most of these data are raw data that needs to go through several processes before it is ready for analysis. Else the data are of no use. In a nutshell, uh, we need different applications to visualize these data more efficiently so we can find insights and make informed decisions. I tell everyone that data is like an ocean. Dive deep to find treasure such as insights and new opportunities. This is exactly what we do at OpenBI. We help businesses transform their raw data into meaningful insights so they can make informed decisions. OpenBI is an enterprise business intelligence suite that comes with various modules as a package to help everyone visualize data more efficiently. So we provide powerful reporting server that allows users from BERT, Jasper, and Pentavo community to publish and manage their reports. And it comes with a lot of advanced reporting features such as scheduling, uh, report busting, group reports, and many more. We also help um, users with dashboards and analytical capabilities with no-code, low-code approach designed for all type of users from people in the front desk to management and to the developers. For advanced users and companies um, who wants to apply machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, on top of their uh, visualization, uh, they can now use popular scripting language like Python and R to extend the machine learning capabilities within their visualization. And we That's also fantastic. help, yeah, we also help many plug and play solutions, SaaS based, so that the companies like um, Asana, Monday.com, and Salesforce users can actually uh, use OpenBI to take this to the next level. Wonderful. Thank you for summing that up for us. Now, how corporations deal with data changed significantly about maybe 10 to 12 years ago and how business operate and, and employees engage also um, seem to become more important about 10 to 12 years ago um, and that reflects in how customers then react to the business so can you tell us more about the significance of data visualizations for organizations communities and individuals Yes, definitely. So data visualization can help improve business efficiency. So not like traditional business intelligence tool these days, everything is more dynamic. So if, if the data visualization is implemented and used correctly, uh, then it can save tons of uh, time and uh, it can help reduce the significant cost as well. So our mission at OpenBI is to create a data culture to help people, organization, and the community to see and understand the data. And this can be achieved by empowering everyone with the data-driven tool. So here are some key advantages of data visualization. It can help find valuable business insights, increase customer satisfaction, identify market trends, increase operational efficiency, uh, improved and accurate decision making, increased revenue, and help organization to build fast and accurate reports and better return on investment. So it can significantly change the way business operates. Excellent. And now sometimes in the business world, um, it 
can get flooded and saturated with jargon and technical terms that get sort of flung around the boardrooms but don't really have a true sense of meaning or doing, so to speak. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the not so tech savvy people can begin their data with the visualization journey, please? I couldn't agree with you more on this, Sage. Uh, there is a great saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. The idea of data visualization is to simplify and make end users understand the story that data has to tell in a simple and presentable way through the visualization. An OpenBI application is designed to provide no code, low code approach. So people with less technical background, they do not have to worry at all, which essentially means you do not need to have any technical knowledge whatsoever. As long as you have a business knowledge uh, and business understanding, you are good to create different visualization by simply using drag and drop components within the application itself. So we welcome everyone to experience no-code, low-code OpenBI apps. That's fantastic. Now, I'm looking at your um, B-roll that's coming up there with the data visualization examples, and it looks very similar to Google Analytics. So it's all compatible with the major brands. Can you tell us a little bit more about the end-to-end -end analytical solutions, please? And also, which industries you're finding a lot of your clients are coming from? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. This is a great question and I'm glad that you asked. Um, so you rightly said that it is quite similar to different analytical tools and which is exactly what it is. The fundamental remains the same. So we intend to simplify the entire end-to-end -end process and empower business with their analytical journey in three simple steps. So we allow them to connect with the data, help them to create different type of visualization they want to, to help understand the business processes and to visualize data more effectively, and then a convey where they can publish the message to the end client through visualizations and incorporate third-party visual libraries within a OpenBI so that they can actually work with multiple applications and see a unified platform. Great, thank you for explaining that. So um, in regards to the industries that are mainly seeking out your services at the moment, are you finding it's e-commerce? Uh, it's mainly, uh, so we are not industry specific. Okay. Uh, so we work with different verticals. So our main clients are from financial background, from ERP systems, from the security background, so SOC. Uh, and we work, we have many clients across Europe and uh, in Austria, in, in some in Middle East, some in India as well. And we have started our uh, journey in the, in the North America region as well. Excellent. Well, hopefully uh, you'll gain some clients from Australia as well after this fantastic interview. And as we reach the end of the interview and start winding up, please tell us about what your near-term plans are at OpenBI. BI. Yes, at OpenBI, we pride on what we do and are looking to expand, uh, as you rightly said, that in, in Australia. So we are, we are planning to expand our network across different geography uh, in coming years and would like to invite individuals and companies uh, from different uh, domains to benefit from data-driven technologies. We want to encourage and build an ecosystem for developers and companies to build plug-and-play solutions for their businesses and in their expert area using OpenBI and make it available to wider audience through OpenBI Marketplace in returns for rewards and recognition. So to quickly summarize, OpenBI is free to download with unlimited users and there is no license fees to pay. And um, for more information on how you can download, what are the charges you might have to pay, uh, we recommend to visit our website uh, and visit uh, an FAQ section at opnbi.com. And finally, um, I would like to thank you, the team at Kalkine TV, for giving us an opportunity to explain the benefits of OpenBI to uh, everyone and who wants to adopt a data-driven culture in their workplace. Well, it sounds like a very time efficient and potentially cost efficient service, um, which will just simplify the whole process of analytics and data visualization. So it sounds great. Thank you so much for sharing what you do with us, Hemant. We really do appreciate your insights. 
Thank you, Sage. Um, Thank you. Bye-bye. If you just joined us, we had a very informative discussion with Herman Meta. He's the founder of OpenBI as well as a CEO. And keep watching for more of these excellent expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calcai Media. Right now, Calcine is offering a seven day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. A group of investors has tabled resolutions urging four of the world's top oil and gas companies to set broad climate targets for 2030, reviving pressure on the sector after a year that saw governments shift their focus to energy security. Activist group Follow This said it had co-filed the resolutions with six major institutional investors managing $1.3 trillion in assets ahead of the annual general meetings of BP, Chevron, ExxonMobil and Shell next year. In the resolutions, the investors call on the companies to set targets to reduce by 2030 greenhouse gas emissions, including those from fuel sold to customers known as Scope 3 emissions, which account for the vast majority of the sector's pollution. Investors have in recent years ramped up pressure on the oil and gas sector to help tackle climate change and the follow this climate related resolutions have drawn growing support among shareholders. However, last year the efforts largely sputtered as investors turned their focus more to higher energy prices and energy security following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Right now, Calcine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. BP, Shell and Chevron have all set some 2030 greenhouse emissions reduction targets that include Scope 3, though Follow This said they are not aligned with the United Nations' ambitions to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. Exxon has yet to set any 2030 Scope 3 target. The group of investors co-filing the resolutions includes Edmund D. Rothschild Asset Management, De Groof Peter Kem Asset Management, and Acmea Asset Management. Follow This did not provide the names of the other backers. Shell, BP and European peers including Total Energies and NI have set out strategies and targets to slash emissions to net zero by 2050 by reducing oil and gas output and growing low carbon and renewable energy businesses. In the United States, 2022 saw a wave of efforts driven by Republican politicians and right-leaning investors to focus executives' attention away from environmental, social or governance themes. Activist investor Strive Asset Management, for instance, is seeking a shareholder vote at the springtime meeting of Chevron to reverse a Scope 3 emissions reduction mandate. Exxon and Chevron have in the past successfully blocked attempts to file climate resolutions with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Alright, that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin.
Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said on Sunday that protecting Ukraine's borders was a constant priority and that his country was ready for all possible scenarios with Russia and its ally Belarus. In one of his nightly video addresses, Zelensky stated that protecting our border, both with Russia and Belarus, is our constant priority and that the country was preparing for all possible defence scenarios. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Zelensky made his remarks on the eve of a visit to Belarus by Russian President Vladimir Putin amid discussions of a possible new offensive by Moscow and suggestions it could originate in Belarus. In his address, Zelensky issued a new appeal to Western nations to provide Ukraine with effective air defences. He also said his forces were holding the town of Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine where some of the fiercest fighting has been seen to date. Alright, that's all for this video, but leave your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like and share. For more content, you can subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. I'm James Preston, reporting for Calkine Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. South Korea on Monday flagged a deeper economic slowdown than expected at least through the first half of next year and extended sales tax breaks on some fuel oil products and passenger cars by a few months. The government is expected later this week to announce its economic policy strategies for next year, which will be the first four-year statement for President Yoon suk Yeol's administration since its launch in May. South Korea's economy, the fourth largest in Asia, relies heavily on exports ranging from cars and ships to chips and smartphones. It's widely expected to see growth fall below 2% next year from close to 3% this year. The central bank last month cut its projection for next year's economic growth to 1.7% from the previous 2.1% in its scheduled revision, citing falling exports and the resultant reduction likely in corporate investment. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. As the economy now has to rely more on domestic consumption to offset cooling export demand, the finance ministry has extended by as much as six months tax breaks on fuel oil products and passenger car sales beyond their original end 2022 expiry. The ministry is due to unveil its 2023 economic projections and strategies on Wednesday. President Yoon, struggling against low approval ratings, says exports are the best choice for the manufacturing heavy country to overcome its slump. The problem is that China, South Korea's top export market, is facing its own problems as its economy feels the impact of years of strict controls to fight COVID-19. Now that you're up to speed, hit that bell icon and subscribe to stay up to date. I'm Molly Shields for Calcai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin.
In a year marked by global monetary tightening, recession concerns and a conflict in Ukraine, many stocks have performed quite well. In this video, we're going to take a look at one such stock that has gained more than 500% since the 1st of January 2022. Turkish Airlines has gained around 544% on a year-to-date basis as of the 16th of December. Turk Havayalari is a Turkey-based company which provides passenger and cargo air transportation services. It operates under the following business segments, which are air transport, which consists of mainly domestic and international passenger and cargo air transportation and technical maintenance services, aircraft repair and infrastructure support related to the aviation sector. In 2022, Turkish cargo continued its strong growth trend over the last decade by building on its market share gains during the pandemic. Their incorporation increased its cargo revenue by 140% during the first nine months of 2022, compared to the same period in 2019. According to the International Air Transport Association, Turkish cargo has strengthened its success by ranking fourth among air cargo carriers in August. In February of this year, Turkish cargo moved cargo operations to its highly technological new hub smartest. Turkish Airlines finished the third quarter of 2022 with a 1.5 billion USD net profit. The company's total revenue during the third quarter of the year was 6.1 billion USD, surpassing the same period in 2019 by 52%. Cargo revenues increased by 110% compared to the same period in 2019 and were recorded as approximately 880 million American dollars. In the first nine months of the year, their incorporation carried 54 million passengers reaching 96 percent of the 2019 level right now calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe don't miss it subscribe for the free trial now Additionally, in the nine months of 2022, Turkish Airlines ranked first among the European network carriers in terms of flights, according to the European Organization for the Safety of Air Navigation. The company has also decided to purchase six A350 to A900 type passenger aircraft from Airbus to be delivered this year and next. Now you can leave a comment below, you can like and subscribe to our channel and you can press the bell icon for video notifications. I'm Rachel for Kalkai Media. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Kalkine Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Kalkine Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin. Right now, Kalkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones for Kalkine Media. Welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today, I'm speaking with Mr. Iggy Tan. He's the Managing Director of Altec Chemicals. Now, the company has already secured land for its upcoming battery anode material plant in Germany. Here to tell us more is Iggy Tan. Good to speak with you today. Good morning and thanks for having me. Looking forward to hearing more about Altec's latest move. So now Altec has recently wrapped up the preliminary feasibility study for its German battery anode material plant. Iggy, can you tell me what were the major findings of this study? Yeah, as you know, uh, just a bit of the background, 
Uh, as you know, there is a push to get uh, more silicon in uh, lithium ion batteries uh, to get the energy density up. And last year we announced that we were successful at uh, producing 30% higher energy uh, lithium ion batteries. And uh, this year we have now progressed to the commercial aspect of that uh, game changing technology and we announced the uh, pre feasibility study for a, a 10,000 ton per annum uh, salumina anode uh, plant to be built in Germany. Uh, just very quickly, the capital investment is about 95 million US dollars, so not a very large capital investment with a, ex, uh, very attractive returns with a net present value of around 507 US million dollars uh, and an internal rate of return uh, at about 40%. Uh, and it should generate around 63 million US dollars, uh, million US dollars per annum uh, during its uh, operating life. So very attractive returns, not a very large capital cost, and consequently, uh, the uh, the board has decided to uh, progress to a definitive feasibility study. That's fantastic news. And the financial figures from the pre-feasibility study are very pleasing. So what will be the next course of action on this project? Yeah, so we are um, advancing on the commercial side. And uh, in order to do that, we have... Uh, committed to build a uh, pilot plant uh, in uh, Saxony, Germany. Uh, and the reason for the pilot plant is we want to be able to produce uh, larger commercial size samples uh, of the salumina anode, which is essentially uh, silicon and graphite uh, with our alumina coating uh, combined as a product called salumina anodes. And the pilot plant will be able to produce commercial samples that we can then send to uh, downstream customers to do their qualification process. So um, at least 30% higher energy lithium ion batteries uh, is the, uh, the objective and it's really game changing technology for the lithium ion battery industry. So we have already purchased the land in Germany. Uh, we are now progressing with the pilot plan and the DFS uh, and we are also have uh, a two very strong German feedstock suppliers. So uh, our, our partners are SGL Carbon, which is uh, one of the largest graphite producers in uh, in Europe, as well as Ferroglobe, one of the largest silicon producers in Europe as well. So it's very important for us uh, to be positioned in Europe as well as sourcing um, materials for the salumina anode material from European suppliers. Well, it all sounds very promising, and it seems as though we could be seeing a significant breakthrough in the technology. Iggy, would you be able to just explain in a little more detail about the silicon barrier? Yeah, uh, very interestingly, um, in Tesla's uh, last battery day, they've announced that uh, they want to get silicon in their lithium-ion batteries to get this step change in energy density, which then reduces the cost of lithium-ion batteries to well below $100 per kilowatt hour. And the silicon has 10 times the energy density compared to graphite. So for a lay person, there are 10 times more sites that the lithium can stick on in the silicon compared to graphite. So silicon is a very promising anode material. Now, if it's such a promising anode material, why isn't it being used in commercial batteries today? And you mentioned the silicon barrier, is that silicon expands 300% in volume during the charging and discharge of the battery, and it fractures, and uh, it causes swelling and delamination. So there's a big problem for, for a lithium ion battery. The other problem is that the uh, first cycle loss is also very large, basically absorbs a lot of lithium on its first charge and it makes it inactive. Now, because of those two problems, um, a lot of companies have been trying to resolve this silicon problem. And our company uh, uses high purity alumina technology. We basically coat the silicon particle with alumina and we coat the graphite particle with alumina 
and we find that resolves the problem of uh, a, a, a volume expansion and fracturing. So by doing that, we essentially cracked the silicon code and we have produced 30% um, higher energy lithium batteries, but more importantly, they're very stable. We've gone and uh, uh, tested the batteries in uh, long-term uh, charge and discard cycles, uh, and they're very, very stable. So very exciting technology. Uh, we believe it's game-changing technology for the lithium-ion battery industry. Absolutely. Um, as you mentioned there, there are other battery anode producers that have been using silicon in their anode material. Now, how is your silicon anode material different from others? Yeah, I, I guess the way the industry has been trying to resolve this battery, uh, this expansion problem, is they've gone to very tiny silicon particles, um, essentially uh, nanotechnology. Uh, and, and that sort of resolves the, the expansion problem, but the problem is that the cost to get to nanotechnology is very expensive. So any benefit from any energy den increase in density uh, is negated by the extra cost of the, the silicon. So what we embarked on was using regular size um, silicon particles, uh, and which then reduces the cost uh, dramatically but using our HPA coding technology uh, to resolve this expansion and first cycle loss problem. Very exciting times. And just looking back to your Germany development as well, are there any offtake agreements from German or any other European companies? Yeah, so the, really that's our next phase of the DFS is where we, uh, um, we want to convert that um, interest into uh, offtake. At the moment, we have uh, some NDAs with uh, two large German automakers, uh, and we have an NDA with a, a European battery maker. Now, we, in the in the next phase, will want to convert that to more secure offtake for the product. Uh, and we are very focused on Europe. Uh, our belief is that the lithium ion battery story will be about Europe in the next two decades. Uh, as you know, lithium ion batteries about, was about Japan, Korea, and China in the past. We believe that the lithium ion battery will be about Europe in the next uh, coming time. Now, the reason for that is really driven by EU uh, CO2 emission standards. And so consequently, all the uh, automakers in Europe have announced to go all electric by 2030 or 2035. So essentially after that period of time, all car manufacturers in Europe will be producing electric vehicles, only electric vehicles. Now, uh, there's something like 600 gigawatts of battery producing capacity that have been announced to meet that demand. And uh, if you follow lithium batteries, you would also follow that 600,000 tons per annum of graphite will be required for those batteries. And I guess that's where our product sits in. We are producing a super graphite anode material with that silicon. So very exciting demand coming up. And that's why we're really focused uh, in Europe. Absolutely. It's an extremely fast moving space to be working in. Thank you so much for your time today, Iggy. Thank you for having me. Thank you and best of luck with the moving forward. And that was Iggy Tan, Managing Director of Alte Chemicals. If you missed any part of that chat, you can catch the full interview on our YouTube channel, Kalkai Media. So make sure to subscribe. I'm Rachel reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Right now, Calkine is offering a seven-day free trial on its premium research reports. Get access to data-driven market insights combined with an in-depth analysis on financial markets across the globe. Don't miss it. Subscribe for the free trial now. If you're looking to keep abreast of the biggest stories from the crypto world, 
the fate of exchanges and crypto hedge funds during the ongoing bear market, and you're wanting to keep up to date with the best and worst performers in the altcoin space and that of flagship currencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, then Calcar Media's daily crypto catch is absolutely essential viewing for you. Tune in each afternoon right here on Calcar Media to get the latest scoop from Anchor to ZeroCoin.